Okay, members. Good morning, Marjorie Moydeev. Uh, at the last sitting, it was announced that Mr. Matthew O'Toole has been returned as a member for South Belfast. For clarity, I would like to add that Mr. O'Toole gave the undertaking and signed the role of membership and entered his designation in the presence of the Speaker and the Clerk and Chief Executive just before the sitting on Saturday, the 11th of January. That's just for the record, and of course, the member is welcome. Moving on to the uh, next item on the order paper. Uh, is the question of suspension of standing order 20, bracket 1. The Deputy Speaker, um, just to make the point, the, yeah, the first uh, that is to suspend standing order 20, bracket 1, and that is in relation to question 10 rescheduling. So could I ask the Clerk to read the motion, please? That standing order 21 be suspended for the 14th of January 2020. And I call on uh, Robbie Butler to move the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before we proceed to the question, I would remind members that this motion requires cross-community support. And the question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour, aye. aye. No. Thank you. The ayes have it. That's, that's uh, agreed. The since there are eyes from all sides of the chamber and there are no dissenting voices, I am satisfied that cross community support has also been demonstrated. Moving on to the establishment of the statutory committees. The next item of business is a motion on the establishment of statutory committees. As this is a business motion, there will be uh, no debate. Uh, would the clerk please read the motion? That in accordance with standing orders 46 and 47, this Assembly determines that nine statutory committees shall be established as follows. The Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, the Committee for <coughs> Communities, the Committee for the Economy, the Committee for Education, the Committee for the Executive Office, the Committee for Finance, the Committee for Health, the Committee for Infrastructure and the Committee for Justice. Terms of reference, quorum and composition of the committees shall be as prescribed in Standing Orders 48 and 49. And I call on uh, Robbie Butler to move the motion. I beg to move, Mr. Speaker. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those contrary say no. I think the ayes have that. Um, that's it. Point of order, Mr. Allister. Uh, I <coughs> notice the motion we've just passed uh, ties itself to standing orders 48 and 49. In consequence, does that mean that the uh, statutory committees are going to continue with a membership of 11? Because that is what, of course, those standing orders say. The session of the committees is, is, is under consideration by the Business Committee, Mr. Allister, so that will be a matter for further consideration by the Business Committee and therefore the House after that. Okay. It's not a matter for the business committee to change standing orders, surely. No. And if standing orders provide for 11, the only manner in which you can avoid 11 is either to change standing orders or suspend standing orders. Are we getting to the point where we're going to suspend that standing well, I'll order? I make the point, and I'll just make this a fair ruling, that the, the business committee will be considering that and will bring it back to the House for further consideration. At the moment, the membership will remain as 11 until further change by the House. Okay, thank you. Okay. Eight. The appointment of the chairpersons and deputy chairpersons of the statutory committees. The next item then on the paper is the appointment of those positions in accordance with the procedure set out in Standing Order 48. She will ask the nominating officer of each political party in the order required by the formula contained in Standing Order 48 to select an available statutory committee and nominate a person who is a member of his or her party and of the Assembly to be its chairperson or deputy chairperson. And it would remain parties of the requirement of Standing Order 48, bracket 5, that nominating officers shall prefer committees in which they do not have a party interest over those in which they do. For the avoidance of doubt, this means I will expect parties to refrain as far as possible from selecting committees that coincide with the ministerial offices held by their party. And I would now call on uh, Arlene Foster's nominating officer 
of the party which has the highest figure under the formula to select an available statutory committee and nominate a person who is a member of her party and of the Assembly to be its chairperson or deputy chairperson. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I choose the Justice Committee and <coughs> I nominate Paul Given to be the chairman. Is the member willing to take up the office for which he has been nominated? Yes, Mr Speaker. Thank you. I announce the appointment of Mr Paul Given, the chairperson of the Justice Committee. I call on John O'Dowd to select an available statutory committee and nominate a member to be its chairperson or deputy chairperson. Uh, we select the Economy Committee and appoint Kiva Archibald to that post. Is the member willing to take up the office for which she has been nominated? I am, Kankoya. I announce the appointment of Kiva Archibald as chairperson of the Economy Committee. I call again on Arling Foster to select and nominate. I select the uh, Communities Department and uh, select Paula Bradley as chair. Thank you. Is the member willing to take up the office for which she has been nominated? I do, Mr. Speaker. Announce the appointment of Paula Bradley as chairperson of the Communities Committee. I call again on John O'Dowd to select and nominate. Uh, we select the Health Committee and appoint Colin Gildernew to that post. Is the member willing to take up the office for which he has been nominated? Tommy, I am. Announce the appointment of Colm Gildernew as the chairperson of the Health Committee. I now call on Ms Dolores Kelly to select an available statutory committee and nominate a member to be its chairperson or deputy chairperson. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. We select the Executive Office and I nominate uh, Colin McGrath as chair. Is the member willing to take up the office for which he has been nominated? I am, Mr Speaker. I announce the appointment of Colin McGrath as chairperson of the Executive Committee. I now call on Steve Aiken to select an available statutory committee and nominate a member to be its chairperson or deputy chairperson. Mr. Speaker, just in, in my standing orders, I will be making a nomination. Is that uh, okay? Has that been cl clarified already? You're saying you're making a nomination? Speaker, I, I, I sent a letter in this morning. Did we receive that letter? Can we just pause for a moment or two? I don't have sight of that. It's just that we don't have sight of that letter. Was it first, was it first class post or second class post? Just have to take a raise just for a minute or two, members. Sorry about this, it's a legal requirement. Okay, members, we'll, uh, we, can, we can recommence. Okay.
Again, Steve, could you confirm that you have conferred to Robbie the responsibility as nominating officer? Uh, for this one thing, Mr. Speaker, I have indeed conferred the responsibility to my chief whip, Robbie Butler. Okay. So, <laughs> okay, so I don't need to rehearse the first. So I now call on Robbie Butler to uh, select and nominate. My, my apologies, Mr. Speaker, for I, I delivered it to the wrong office. I probably wouldn't make a good post person. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I, we take the uh, committee for finance and I nominate Steve Aitken. <laughs> Order now. Okay, is, is the member willing to take up the office for which he has been nominated? <laughs> Delighted to, Chief. Okay. I announce the appointment of Steve Aitken as the chairperson of the Finance Committee. I call again on Arlene Foster to select and nominate. Uh, speaker, I select the Committee for Infrastructure and I nominate Michelle McElveen as chairperson. Is the member willing to take up the office for which he has been nominated? I am, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I announce the appointment of Michelle McElveen of, as chairperson of the Infrastructure Committee. I call again on John O'Dowd to select and nominate. Uh, can call you. We select the Environment, Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee and we appoint Declan McAleer. Is the member willing to take up the office for which he has been nominated? Um, uh, Ta, yes, can call you. Uh, I announce the appointment of Declan. Uh, yeah. So I announce the appointment of Declan McAleer as chairperson of the Environment, Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee. The, I now call on Kelly Armstrong to select and nominate, please. Mr. Speaker, we choose the Department of Education and Mr. Chris Little to be chair of that, of that committee. Is the member willing to take up the office for which he has been nominated? Yes, Mr. Speaker. I announce the appointment of Chris Little as the chairperson of the Education Committee. I call on Arling Foster to select and nominate. I select uh, the Finance Committee and I nominate Paul Frew as the Vice Chair. Is that not done? Oh, Is the member willing to take up the office for which he has been nominated? Mr. Speaker. Okay, so I nominate the appointment of Paul Frew as the Vice Chairperson of the Finance Committee. I call on John O'Dowd to select and nominate. Uh, we select the Vice Chair of the Justice Committee and appoint Linda Dillon to that position. Is the member willing to take up the office for which she has been nominated? I am, can I I announce the appointment of Linda Dillon as the Vice Chairperson of the Justice Committee. I call on Dolores Kelly to select and nominate. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we select the Department of the Economy Chair, uh, uh, Vice Chair Sinead McLaughlin. Is the member willing to take up the office for which she has been nominated? I am, Chair. And Speaker. Okay, I announce the appointment of Sinead McLaughlin as the Vice Chair of the Department of the Economy Committee. I call on Arlene Foster to select and nominate. I select the Health Committee and I nominate Gary Middleton as the Vice Chair. Is the member willing to take up the office for which he has been nominated? I am, Mr. Speaker. I announce the appointment of Gary Middleton as the Vice Chair of the Health Committee. I call on John O'Dowd to select and nominate. We select the Vice Chair of Education Committee and appoint Karen Mull. Is the member willing to take up the office for which he has been nominated? Yes, Karen. I announce the appointment of Karen Mullen as the Vice Chairperson of the Education Committee. I call on Robbie Butler to select and nominate. Take it back. Okay. Sorry, communities. Uh, we sorry. I've lost our list. We, we, we select the Executive Office and Mike Nesbitt. Okay. Sorry, sorry. So, okay. Is the member willing to take up the office for which he has been nominated? I am. 
Okay, I announce the appointment of Mike Nesbitt as the Vice Chairperson of the Executive Committee. I call on Arlene Foster to select and nominate. I choose the Committee for Infrastructure and I appoint David Hilditch as the Vice Chair. Is the member willing to take up the office for which he has been nominated? Yes, Mr. Schmigger. I announce the appointment of David Hildes as the Vice Chairperson of the Infrastructure Committee. I call on John O'Dowd to select and nominate. Uh, <coughs> can call you. We select the Vice Chair of the Environment, Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee and appoint Philip McGuigan. Is the member willing to take up the office for which he has been nominated? Ta, can call you. Yes. I announce the appointment of Philip McGuigan as the Vice Chairperson of the of the Environment, Agricultural and Rural Affairs Committee. I call on Kelly Armstrong to select and nominate. Mr Speaker, for the final Vice Chair and um, Department of Communities and the nomination for the Alliance Party is myself, Kelly Armstrong. Is the member willing to accept the nomination for us? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, sort of, I sort of thought you would. All right, so uh, I now announce the appointment of uh, Ms. Kelly Armstrong as the Vice Chairperson of the Communities Committee. That concludes, members, the appointment of the Chairpersons and Deputy Chairpersons of Statutory uh, Committees. So, Moving on now to the uh, appointment of chairs and deputy chairs of standing committees. Nick, so that's the next item on the order paper. Uh, I'm required to supervise the appointment of a chairperson and deputy chairperson to each standing committee other than the business committee in accordance with the procedure set out in standing orders 51. So I'll ask a nominating officer for each political party in the order required by the formula contained in standing order 51 bracket 2. Uh, in to select an available standing committee and nominate a person who is a member of his or her party and of the Assembly to be chairperson or deputy chairperson. Uh, before we commence, I do remain members of the requirement of Standing Order 56, bracket 3, that neither the chairperson nor deputy chairperson of the Public Accounts Committee shall be a member of the same political party as the Minister of Finance or of any junior minister appointed to the Department of Finance. Uh, I now call on Ms Arling Foster as nominating officer of the party which has the highest figure under the formula laid down in standing orders to select an available standing committee and nominate a person who is a member of, his, of her party and of the Assembly to be chairperson or deputy chairperson of it. Of it. Thank you. I choose the Public Accounts Committee and I nominate William Humphrey as chair. Is the member willing to take up the office for which he has been nominated? Announce the appointment of William Humphreys as the chairperson of the Public Accounts Committee. I call on John O'Dowd to select an available standing committee and nominate a person who is a member of his party and of the Assembly to be chairperson or deputy chairperson of it. Uh, can call you. We select the Standards and Privileges Committee and appoint Sinead Annas. Sinead, sorry. Sorry, uh, appoint Sinead Annas. Is the member willing to take up the office for which he has been nominated? I am, can call you. Announce the appointment of Sinead Annis as the uh, chairperson of the Standing, Standards and Privileges Committee. Call on Arlene Foster to select and nominate. Uh, I select the AERC committee and nominate Mervyn Storey as chairperson. I understand Mr Storey has submitted a letter to the Speaker's office because unfortunately he has a family bereavement and cannot be here today. Thank you, Ms Foster. Um, I have received correspondence from Mervyn Storey that he is willing to accept the nomination and I therefore announce the appointment of Mervyn Storey as chairperson of the Assembly and Executive Review Committee. And could I, on behalf of the Assembly, extend our condolences to Mervyn uh, on the death of his father? Okay, thank you very much, members. Okay. I call on John O'Dowd, who select and nominate. Uh, can call you. We select the Procedures Committee and appoint Carol Nicolin. Is the member willing to take up the office for which he has been nominated? 
Clackham, I accept Hancola. I announce the appointment of Carl Neekillen as Chairperson of the Procedures Committee. I call on Dolores Kelly to select and nominate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We select Audit Committee and nominate Daniel McCross. Is the member willing to take up the office for which he has been nominated? I do, Mr. Speaker. I announce the appointment of Daniel McCrossan as the chairperson of the Audit Committee. And I call on Steve Egan to select an available standing committee and nominate a person here for that post. Uh, we nominate uh, Roy Beggs to the Public Accounts Committee. That's the vice chair, am I right? Is the member willing to take up the office for which he has been nominated? I am willing to take up the office of vice chair. Thank you. I announce, I announce the appointment of Roy Beggs, the vice chairperson of the, Roy, of the Public Accounts Committee. I call on Arlene Foster to select a nominate. I select the Standards and Privileges Committee and I nominate William Irwin as vice chair. Who's William Irwin? Is the member willing to take up the office for which he has been nominated? I am, Mr. Speaker. I announce the appointment of William Irwin, Irwin off as the Vice Chairperson of the Standards and Privileges Committee. I call on John O'Dowd to select the nominate. We, have a call you. we select the Vice Chair of the Assembly Executive and Review Committee and appoint Melissa McHugh. The member willing to take up the office for which he has been nominated? Thank you. I announce the appointment of Melissa McHugh as the Vice Chairperson of the IRC. I call on Kelly Armstrong to select and nominate. Mr Speaker, we, we choose the Audit Committee and appoint Andrew Muir as Vice Chair. Is the member willing to take up the office for which he has been nominated? I, I am. <clears throat> I announce the appointment of Andrew Muir as the Vice Chairperson of the Audit Committee. Call on Arlene Foster to select and nominate. Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Procedures Committee is what is left, and I nominate Tom Buchanan as Vice Chair. Is the member willing to take up the office for which he has been nominated? Thank you. I announce the appointment of Tom Buchanan as Vice Chair of the Procedures Committee. Thank you, members. That concludes the appointment of chairpersons and deputy chairpersons of standing uh, committees. Move on to the next item, which is suspension of standing order 79-2. The first item of business is a motion to suspend standing order 79-2. Clerk, please read the motion. The standing order 79-2 be suspended for the 14th of January 2020. Robbie Butler to move the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg to move the motion. Before we proceed to the question, I would remind members that this motion requires cross-community support. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. As there are ayes from all sides of the chamber and there are no dissenting voices, I'm satisfied the cross-community support has been demonstrated. Uh, the next motion is appointment to the Assembly Commission. The next item uh, is, is a motion. Uh, on this appointment to the Assembly Commission. As with other similar motions, it will be treated as a business motion and there will be no debate. I should remind members of standing orders require that such a motion be approved with cross-community support. Clerk, please read the motion. That in accordance with Standing Order 79, the following shall be appointed to be members of the Assembly Commission. The Speaker, ex officio, Ms Kelly Armstrong, Mr Robbie Butler, Mrs Pam Cameron, Mrs. Dolores Kelly and Mr. John O'Dowd. I call on Robbie Butler to move the motion. Uh, so moved, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper in the names of the members of the business committee be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To those contrary say no. As there are ayes from all sides of the chamber and there are no dissenting voices, I am satisfied the cross community support has been demonstrated. The motion is agreed. We'll move on to the next item, which is the election of a principal deputy speaker. Uh, the process will be conducted in accordance with Standing Order 5A. I will begin by asking for a nomination. Any member may rise to nominate one of the deputy speakers to act as principal deputy speaker. I will then confirm that the person nominated is willing to act as principal deputy speaker, and then a debate relevant to that nomination may, be, may take place. 
The Business Committee has agreed that only one member should speak on behalf of each party in the debate. They will be allowed up to three minutes each. At the end of the debate, I will put the question on the nomination. The vote will be on a cross-community basis. Of course, if the proposal is not carried, I shall ask for further nomination and the process may be repeated. Do I have a proposal for a Deputy Speaker to be nominated as Principal Deputy Speaker? And members should rise in their places. Uh, just a, a few days ago, a number of parties signed up to the new decade, uh, new approach, and entered the executive in good faith, and that's signalling a new approach in terms of being inclusive and power sharing. There is no purpose or point to this item other than to confer an elevated title on one of three uh, deputy speakers. Um, well, if I could just very quickly, what we're just saying is that we're just making the point that we don't support it. It's and not a point of order. You'll have, right, five, you'll have three minutes to speak to that motion. Okay, thank you. Mr Lance. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I nominate Mr Christopher Stolfer to the post of Principal Deputy Speaker of this Assembly. Uh, Deputy Speaker, who was that nominated? Lady Agnes, Principal Deputy Speaker. The standing orders provide for a debate to take place on the nomination. Members may speak only once in the debate. Standing order 5, bracket 7, requires the debate to be relevant to a nomination. It will not allow members to stray into any other area. Members will have up to three minutes in which to speak. And I call on the member who made the nomination, Gordon Lance. Thank you uh, very much, um, Mr. Speaker. And on behalf of the Democratic Unionist Party, I'm delighted to be able to nominate uh, Mr. Christopher Stolford to the position of uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. I know um, Christopher, and I've known him for, for quite a number of years. Uh, I know how committed he is to his constituents and to serving in public life, and I have no doubt. Um, that if the House uh, agrees to make him Principal Deputy Speaker, he, uh, he will serve, uh, and he will serve well uh, in this place. Uh, he does, of course, have uh, previous uh, experience of, of chairing debates, having previously served as uh, Deputy uh, Lord Mayor of, of Belfast. Mr Speaker, I know it's not the tradition uh, in this House for the Speaker to wear a wig or for the Speaker to wear robes. That may well change if the um, Deputy Speaker, who I am nominating, has uh, his way. I, I send that as a way uh, of warning, and I hope that that will not turn off uh, any members from uh, supporting him uh, at this time. But all joking aside, uh, we have confidence um, in his abilities, we have confidence in his impartiality, and we know that he will uh, do a good service uh, to the House and to the people of Northern Ireland in this role. Thank you. Before I call the next speaker, I just want to make a point uh, for the benefit of all members. And this, I want to address this directly to Mr. Colin McGrath. There will be plenty of opportunities in this House for members who feel aggrieved or who disagree with any ruling of the speaker, but I will not tolerate yourself, Member McGrath, or anybody else coming up the back of this podium insulting the speaker in the middle of a plenary debate. I will not accept that. So in future, in future I, will, I will take action. Order. Order. I want people to take note of that. Okay, that's the twice in two days that that has happened from the member. That's why I'm taking this unusual step. I will not allow that behaviour to continue. Okay. Next speaker. Order. Order in the house. Next speaker, please, Nicola Mallon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, yeah. A few days ago, a number of parties signed up to the uh, New Decade, New Approach Agreement in the sense that it was the basis upon which we were entering the executive in good faith. And it was, and it is, uh, we believe, uh, adopting a new way of doing politics, one based on inclusivity and genuine power sharing. There is no purpose or point to this item other than to confer, as I was saying, an elevated title on one of three deputy speakers who actually all hold equal roles. It represents and is sadly a continuation of a past decade and a past approach and we cannot support it. I do want to make the point though that this is in no way reflective or related to Mr Christopher Stolford, whom our party has full support and faith in. It is not the appointment of Mr Stolford uh, that we disagree with. It is the title that is conferred upon it. Yeah. <laughs> 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Alliance Party, every, each time that this rule has come up, we have always opposed it on the reasons that have already been spelled out. It is an honorary title. This has, our opposition to it has no bearing on any of the three deputy speakers, but we just feel that in this day and age to appoint someone as apparently a higher elevation than the others when it actually isn't. There's no money attached to this. There's no other privilege or prestige to it other than a title. Therefore, the Alliance Party will be opposing um, any of the nominations today. Thank you. I call on Jim Allister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, as has been said correctly, this is a non-post. It is a post uh, surely uh, for vanity purposes to uh, emphasise the carve-up between the two main parties. I remind the House that this post was specially created not because of need, not because of any compulsion to help the running of this House, but it was created in 2011 as a SOP to Sinn Féin to give someone a title. Now, some from Sinn Féin benches, of course, in a former life enjoyed titles uh, and perhaps were finding it difficult to live without them. Uh, so we created this preposterous post of principal deputy speaker, as if inserting the word principal bestowed any powers over and above those which exist for any deputy speaker. Principal deputy speaker has no powers, no rights, no authority, no standing above a, any other deputy speaker. So why do we have that title? It's a title which is a nonsense in itself and is but, as I've said, a perpetuation of the carve-up in this House. Uh, and Mr Stalford, I'm, no, I'm sure, will carry it off with great aplomb. may not have been the title he was hoping for, he may have been hoping for the title of junior minister in the executive office, but I suppose the crumbs are, are better, uh, he might think, than nothing. Though I would tell him nothing is a very good place to be in respect of this House. Okay, I call on Paul Gibbon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I just say that this, this position uh, is akin to a similar position that exists in Westminster. It's not unusual for there to be uh, a distinguishing feature amongst the deputy speakers that exist there. So this isn't something that uh, should cause any concern, particularly to those unionists in this House. Um, in respect of the nomination uh, of Christopher Stalford, uh, Christopher and I go back many years in the Young Democrats of the uh, Democratic Unionist Party. I first met him whenever I was 15. Uh, we sat together in a school debate in Belfast City Hall, Mr Speaker, a place that you would have been familiar with. I'm not sure if you chaired those proceedings, but at that point, um, Christopher and I ended up sitting beside each other, and we uh, had a very successful tag team event in the debating. Uh, the behaviour uh, that Christopher demonstrated, I'm sure he'll not repeat as a principal deputy speaker, and he will uh, be on his best behaviour in this House. Uh, and I have no doubt that Christopher uh, will be able to carry out uh, the role of Principal Deputy Speaker in the distinguished fashion uh, that he is accustomed to. Uh, I know uh, he also uh, is mindful uh, of his own roots as a working class uh, unionist who is pleased to uh, be able to take up uh, this position within the Assembly as well. Thank you. Um so just uh, that, that concludes the debate. There are no other members indicating to speak. So I do remind the Assembly that cross-community support is required. The question is that the nomination of Deputy Speaker Christopher Stalford to act as Principal Deputy Speaker be approved. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. No. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. No. Okay, let the, the House divide. We'll have a division on that. Okay. The members clear the lobbies. The question will be put in three minutes.
OK. Members, resume your seats, please. OK, members, resume your seats. Thank you. Thank you, members. OK. So the question is that Christopher Stalford As, the question is, will Christopher Stalford act as Principal Deputy Speaker be approved? All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary say no. No. Okay, so uh, do we have tellers? Do we have tellers? Tellers have to approach the desk. Approach, approach the desk, please. Okay, members, so the tellers for the ayes are George Robinson and Morris Bradley. <coughs> tellers for the noes are Sinead McLaughlin and Paula Bradshaw. Clear the lobbies, the Assembly will divide. Ayes to my right, noes to my left.
Secure the doors. Secure the doors, please. Yeah. Okay, members, can members, could I just ask people to take a raise for a couple of minutes? There's a difficulty with the uh, technology, the IT system for the moment, so please take your raise, but the doors are still secure.
Okay, members, I just need to apologise. We're still having technical difficulties with the IT system, so we're going to defer this, the result of the vote until later in the business this morning. Um, so, members content with that. Uh, on fasten the doors, please. Thank you. Moving on now to the. Uh, I've received notice from the Minister of Education, Mr. Peter Weir, that he wishes to make a statement, and I now invite the Minister to address the Assembly. Thank you. We wait with <laughs> bated breath for the um, result of the very close contest we've just taken part in. I would like to make a statement updating the Assembly on my capital uh, investment plans under the second call to the School Enhancement Programme, also known as SEP2. Uh, by way of background, the School Enhancement Programme was first announced in June of 2012, and the programme makes funding of between half a million and four million available for projects aimed at referring or extending existing school provision. And I suppose particularly for members that are maybe unfamiliar with the project, just make it clear that is not a new school build, but it is uh, refurbishing or extending existing school provision. The first call to SEP was launched in January 2013 and resulted in projects in 50 schools being announced uh, to advance in planning. 47 of those, uh, of those projects are either now complete or close to completion, with two currently on site. One project is on hold pending a decision on a major works project funded under the Fresh Start Agreement for shared and integrated education. Given the success of SEP1, on the 25th of January 2017, I made a written statement to the Assembly on my proposal to make a second call for applications under the programme. By closing date of the 28th of February 2017, a total of 165 applications had been received under the call. These applications were then assessed under the agreed protocol and separate priority listed created for primary, post-primary schools and special schools. To ensure a pipeline of SEP projects was maintained uh, in the absence of, of ministers, the Department's Permanent Secretary made an announcement in May of 2018 of 25 projects from the prioritised list to advance in planning. These, uh, these projects have an estimated uh, investment of 60 million. A further 16 schools with an enhanced investment of 40 million was announced by the Permanent Secretary in January of 2019. Today, I'm pleased to announce a further 18 schools which will advance in planning under the School Enhancement Programme. 12 of these are primary schools, five are post-primary schools, and there is one uh, special school uh, which will benefit in total from an estimated capital investment of about 45 million. Mr. Speaker, the 12 primary schools to advance in planning are as follows. Botanic Primary School in Belfast, uh, Carrick Primary School in Lurgan, Cliftonville Controlled Integrated Primary School in Belfast, Glen Craig Controlled uh, Integrated Primary School uh, close to Hollywood, Hollywood uh, sorry, Holy Child Primary School in Londonderry, Irvinstown, Irvinstown Primary School, Kilcooley Primary School, Kilinchy Primary School, St John the Baptist Primary School in Belfast, St Kieran's Primary School uh, Dunmurray, St Paul's Primary School in Micah Drive, Belfast, and Straban Primary School. The five post-primary schools are Glastry College, Ballyhalbert, St Louis Grammar School, Ballymena, St Patrick's College, Macara, Sullivan Upper School, Hollywood, and Victoria College, Belfast. And the 18th school, which will receive investment, is Riverside Special School, which is in Antrim. This is a significant investment, which will deliver much-needed capital investment uh, in schools, the school's estate, via the School Enhancement Programme. Improving the school's estate is a priority for me, and the SEP programme, I think, has been an excellent way of delivering capital works projects, which have an immediate positive impact on the schools and pupils. But as well as the education sector, today's announcement is not just good news for the schools themselves, but will also represent a welcome boost to the economy, especially the construction industry. In addition to this SEP announcement, I continue to advance the programme of major capital bills as well as a programme of much needed minor works across the estate. I will also look uh, to invest in maintenance works across all schools to ensure schools are fit for purpose and enable effective teaching and learning for the benefit of all our, young, all our children and young people. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Thank you, Minister. And I'd like to call the Chairperson of the Education Committee, Chris Little. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a privilege to serve as chairperson of the Assembly Education Committee. I look forward to working with committee colleagues and the minister to ensure we deliver better education for all in our community. There are obviously many serious challenges facing education to which we must respond decisively. Capital investment is urgently needed by many schools in Northern Ireland, and whilst this announcement is welcome news for a small number of schools, radical investment and reform is needed to ensure all our school facilities are fit for purpose. So can I ask the Minister, therefore, how and when he will establish the root and branch independent review of education envisaged by the New Deal proposals in order to deliver a reformed, integrated and sustainably resourced education system for all? Well, uh, first of all, may I congratulate the member um, on his appointment to the, the Chair of the Education Committee. I know from the previous mandate when he had worked as, as Vice Chair of his particular passion and involvement and knowledge of, of education. So I look forward to working with him, uh, with the Vice Chair and indeed all the members of the Education Committee whenever they are appointed. Uh, he's right that uh, in terms of the announcement today, it's uh, call it even on the capital side, one piece of the, the jigsaw. And I think it's important as we move ahead that there will be a mixture of announcements, some dealing with minor works, some uh, potentially with further SEP um, programme announcements, and also major capital works. I think it's important that as we move ahead that that uh, is part of an overall coordinated p position of and picture on how we're actually going to deliver, particularly the school estate, in terms of, of education. Uh, he mentions about the need for reform, and I would concur with him. Uh, it's undoubtedly the case that um, while for any incoming minister, there are major challenges out there in terms of resources. There is also a very strong need to ensure that, that we get the best possible delivery for all our children. So it is also an uh, issue of transformation uh, and of um, reform. And I think that anyone believing that it's simply one or other is the same. I, I would be working, I'm committed to the, um, uh, the new document in terms of the delivery uh, of that um, uh, of that. Uh, committee of looking at the uh, project, looking then at how we globally, if you like, reform education, and I hope to bring uh, proposals soon to the Assembly in, in connection with that. Thank you, Minister. Could I call Christopher Stalford? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm very grateful to the Minister for his statement and the additional investment that will be going into the schools in my constituency, particularly in Botanic Primary School and in Victoria College. It is the ambition, or at least it should be the ambition of us all, that we have a school estate that's fit for the education <coughs> of our children. Uh, on the theme of all politics being local, can I ask the Minister, therefore, to indicate that he's prepared to visit Nettlefield Primary School on the Woodstock Road to see for himself the need for capital investment to improve the facilities in that particular school? I thank the, the member for uh, his comments. I, I suspect, uh, particularly when we're dealing with school enhancement programme and indeed capital build for schools. There may, I, I, uh, I have not great foresight, but I, I suspect that there may be a theme running through a number of these questions which may contain a certain level of um, local interest. And it's good that, that, that MLAs do have that local interest. I will consider, I, I would be, try to accommodate as many invitations as possible. Um, obviously, I, I don't want to give a specific commitment to an individual um, invitation. But certainly, I, I'll be trying, I think it's important that any minister, particularly an education minister, gets out and about as much as possible. Uh, there is, I think, across the system um, a need for capital investment. Uh, and indeed, what we need to ensure that any child is not disadvantaged because of the physical fabric or the lack of facilities that, that go through, any, uh, through the gates of any particular school. Uh, that means that, that any investment programme, any money that's made available has got to be done on a robust and impartial way within that. But as part of that, I'll be willing and more than happy to visit a range of schools across Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you, Minister. Could have called Karen Mullen, Vice Chairperson of the Education Committee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Firstly, I'd like to congratulate the Minister on his appointment, and I look forward to working with, alongside you and all our members of the committee, progressing the work that we'd already been doing um, all along. Uh, and I also welcome today's announcement of much-needed capital investment, in particular for the Holy Child Prim Primary School in Craig in, in Derry, a school in my constituency that's over 60 years old and in much need of, of improved accommodation. 
I'd like to ask the Minister, given the crisis in the education budget, is it your intention to advance the programme of major capital builds and all our works across the school estate? I congratulate the, the member on her appointment to vice chair and I look forward. I know the work that she has put in over the last few years as the spokesperson for Sinn Féin on education and I look forward to her continuing that work and working through the formal structures of the, of the committee. Um, in terms of the wider picture, yes, it, it is undoubtedly the case that this is part of a, a wider picture, a wider jigsaw of a need for capital investment. The member, I suppose, makes reference to the financial pressures that are there in education. <coughs> Uh, those are undoubtedly the case and we'll be working with executive colleagues on a range of financial pressures uh, that are there which need dealt with. I suppose there is a little bit more um, positive news in terms of the capital side of it and in terms of um, major capital works that's something we'll be looking to uh, advance as well. It's important that there is, if you like, a, a flow of works that, that are happening uh, that can then lead to a level of uh, improvement. It is undoubtedly the case, um, and I am sure various members will have particular schools that they would have in mind in their own constituency, that while I think there will be a considerable amount that will be spent on, uh, on school improvement uh, through a range of these, these projects, it is always the case that if there is more money that is available, more money can be spent. And to that extent, I think we're also trying to um, deal with a certain level of backlog of, of both maintenance work uh, and indeed a need to try and provide the best possible facilities uh, for all our pupils. Okay, thank you, Minister. Can I call on uh, Colin McGrath. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I welcome and congratulate uh, Minister Weir on his position of Minister. I know that will provide a certain amount of continuity, and I look forward to discussing important issues such as special education needs and indeed youth services uh, in the period ahead. Um, with the announcement today, though, the, um, there can be a bit of a concern sometimes that the gap between the announcement and the shovel actually going into the ground can be too long. Could the Minister give us some assurances to the work that he will undertake uh, to ensure that these projects are delivered in a timely manner? Yeah, I think, um, and again, also welcome. I, mean, I, I hope um, the, obviously the members become the chair of the TEO committee, uh, and I hope the TEO's gain doesn't become education's loss. Uh, and uh, while it's obviously not my position to appoint members to the, the Education Committee and certainly value the experience that the, the members brought on the, the issues again as the SDLP education spokesperson. Um, the one advantage I think with the school enhancement programme, and it is now a well trialled and well worked uh, scheme, has been unlike, and it can be the case of any capital build, whether it's schools, hospitals or a range of other things, that if you are looking at um, a major capital program involving new works, there can be a reasonable, a very long delay between announcement and completion. The advantage, I think, of, of the school enhancement program, because it is effectively of a scale between half a million and four million, because it effectively is work on site, and so therefore, for instance, one of the processes which happens with new capital build is you have to go through a process of a site search to make sure that you're getting best value for public money and indeed finding the most appropriate place for that. Because essentially these will therefore be on site, the timescale between announcement uh, and ultimately completion tends to be a shorter period than would be there for major capital announcement. So, and I think in the past what we have seen, and I mentioned about uh, the, the fact that I think of the initial tranche, we're now I think 47 out of 50 are, are more or less completed on that basis. Again, for all of us, I'm sure there's always a frustration about how quickly these things are turned around. But certainly we will be making sure that, that this happens as soon as, as can be practical for each of those individual schools. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister Weir, can I also congratulate you on your appointment as Minister of Education? Um, can, I also, can I welcome, I welcome the school enhancement programme where 18 extra schools have been added to the list and the capital investment of 45 million that is going into them. However, and particularly, I'm pleased to see Irvinstown Primary School from Fermanagh South thrown on it. So that should give them a boost. However, can you confirm that this money is now available and ring-fenced for this purpose immediately? 
don't forget the expenditure. I mean, first of all, again, I, without this sounding a little bit like a loving of former education spokespersons, because I know I think you're the, uh, the fourth uh, member of the uh, spokesperson for the, the parties to uh, be able to speak. I, again, sort of uh, look forward to working with yourself. Uh, the money is available because it's a capital bill. There is a flow of projects. The department is confident the money is, is there. Uh, because the money will, in that sense, most of it will not be spent absolutely immediately. It won't occur probably within this financial year on that basis. But there is confidence that that, that money, unless there is some radical change of direction from the, um, the executive to suddenly to cut all programmes of some nature, uh, there is confidence that the money is there. It's not dependent upon additional resources, for example, from the British government. Um, and there has been a, a long tradition on a number of calls with the SEP, so uh, people can take that the announcement of these 18 schools will happen. To call on Michelle Magaldine, please. From the outset, I'd like to declare that I am a, a governor of Kalinchi Primary School, and I've obviously met EA on a number of the impor of important issues in relation to the school. I am delighted that both Kalinchi Primary School and Glastry College are um, going to benefit from the Minister's announcement here today. Would the Minister be in a position to give details of the anticipated work which is to be carried out, um, the amount of money to be allocated and the likely timescales for delivery for both of those skills? I, I thank the member. I know obviously she's been very proactive, <coughs> on, particularly on behalf of Kalinchi uh, Primary and pressing the case for it. I, I, I would highlight a couple of things. First of all, I think the money available uh, in each case, will be up to four million. It's probably somewhere in the region, likely to be in the region of uh, around about three to four million each. Uh, in terms of the detail of what, what will happen, I think it's important because I suspect this will uh, be raised by a number of, of members. The next steps in terms of the, the process will be then uh, that there will be then work going on between the department and the individual schools to work up the, the project. Um, in terms of that, this will mean that for the 18 schools, all 18 have been approved, all will receive their SEP. The detail of what they specifically get may alter as a result of those discussions. And on some occasions in the past, that can also be of an additional positivity. Sometimes that could be a certain level of substitution of what has been provided because it may be found, for example, that uh, a school, uh, the, the top priority actually is getting ensuring that it's got safe wiring or something of that nature can also be the case that sometimes within the envelope of money that's available, if it's then found that the, the project can be delivered at a, um, uh, at a rate below what is, uh, there may be some additional money that can be available at times. On the specifics of the two bits, uh, so therefore, the remarks I make about, about what is proposed in relation to it will reflect these are what the asks of the school, not necessarily what the end result will be. Last year, I think I've highlighted the uh, issue of additional accommodation uh, to bring it up to the schedule of accommodation. So, uh, for example, there are a number of units within it that are currently undersized. There is a lack of availability, for instance, of a sports hall. So that will be formed part of the discussions, particularly as regards Glastry. Uh, for Kalinchi, again, it's uh, accommodation issues, issues around size, and I know there's been a particular issue around traffic management with the school, which I think will be a, a level of priority as well. I think those reflect the asks of the school. There will then be an iteration of discussion around those projects with the individual schools. So I think that's an important caveat to, to make clear to people. But the fact it will mean that all these schools will receive a school enhancement programme. Thank you. And a call on Gemma Dolan. Gordon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the Minister for his statement. And in particular, I welcome his inclusion of Irvinstown Primary School in the school enhancement project. Will the Minister ensure the next stage is delivered as soon as possible? Thank you. There will be no uh, delay in, in relation to that, um, in connection with that. We will, and again, there's been, I think it's fair comment to say, there's always been good work between the department on the SEP project, and it has been one of the more, uh, and I appreciate, I think, the former minister, uh, O'Dowd, was actually the person who originally uh, announced this. Um, and I think that as part of that, there has been a, a good working relationship between schools, between contractors, uh, and the department in helping to deliver this. So certainly there will be no undue delays. And as I said, because of some of the restrictions that don't apply to the school enhancement programme, as opposed to a much larger capital pro, uh, particular build, which might involve a 20 or 30 million pound project, uh, you know, schools are not simply refurbished or new classrooms overnight. 
but it is something which actually in terms of the timescales are a lot better than other capital projects. So certainly there will not be any levels of delay. No. Okay, thank you. And I'll call Gordon Dunn. And I too congratulate uh, Minister Weir on his re-election and uh, I am delighted that he has um, included three schools within the North Down area and I'm, I must congratulate him on remembering his roots and where he came from and, uh, and no doubt it probably did not influence him in the decision. But can, can the Minister um, indicate um, how we justify the school enhancement programme against a new build? for the specific buildings and is the public getting value for money or is this just a short term exercise which is putting off the, the dreaded day when we need new buildings in a lot of these areas rather than just a, a short term fix? Well, is a, a, um, a cocktail of um, capital projects. Uh, I think that the issue, I think it, it's important that in terms of the um, capital money that is available, that we ensure that there's a steady spend of that money to be able to deliver for people. Um, as such, yes, it does, I believe, deliver value for money. If we were in a situation that, for example, school enhancement programmes were simply in place of there ever being any capital, uh, nature capital build, I think that would be the wrong approach. But similarly, if we simply concentrated on new capital builds, you'd have a limited number of projects, and this is an opportunity to be able to deliver that. It's also the case that while in some cases, and I'm sure even some of the schools that, that applied uh, would in an ideal world like a new, entirely new capital build, um, it is also the case that on a case-by-case -case basis that not all schools will require a new capital build. Sometimes as well it is also the case that it is less about the, um, the fabric of the existing building but may well be a lack of particular facility. So, it may mean that, that while the school building itself is, is very good, there may be a lack of a sports hall. Or while provision of, for example, say, subject matters in English and history may be, may be fine, um, the level of, of, um, uh, of science lab uh, may be sort of um, needed, to be, needed to be looked at or whatever. Okay, thank you. I'll call Emma Sheeran. Gormagat Kankorlia, August Kugarjis Lap to air the rule new. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I just want to congratulate you on your new role. I also want to thank the Minister and congratulate you on your new role. I, like others around this chamber, uh, want to welcome this statement, particularly in relation to St. Pat's College in Mahara, which is in my own constituency of Mid Ulster. Uh, my party has met with Mrs. Musson and the team there on several occasions, and I can attest to the urgent need for, for this capital investment. On her behalf, I would like to ask the Minister if he could provide an indication of the timescale of this project and when like, work is likely to begin? In terms of the, uh, the project, first of all, I mean, I, I think I had, I seem to remember on, on previous posts, had the opportunity to visit uh, St Pat's, although it, it's now, there's that many schools have either been visited or not visited, and I'm sure former ministers can also refer to this. You're trying to work out whether well, there's a slight false memory in relation to that. In terms of timescales, um, yes, across the board, I, I it's, can't give specific commitments to individual ones, but the intention would be then that, that work would be able to begin in uh, the year 22-23, and the general rule of thumb for school enhancement programme would be about an 18-month uh, project, so the idea would be that those could be completed within that period. So whereas the most major capital bills, sometimes even when they're announced, maybe five or even close to ten years before there's completion, there can be much greater turnaround, I think we would aim to have these completed in 24, 25. Uh, so, you know, we're talking, we are still talking about a few years away, and, but that will be slightly sort of uh, moving scale in terms of, in terms of, in terms of time scale, but we hope to get these progressed really as quickly as possible. Thank you, and I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I join with others in congratulating uh, Minister Weir on his appointment as Education Minister, and I welcome uh, the uh, inclusion of Carrick Primary School from my own constituency. And the Minister may know that whilst it's not a fully uh, formal integrated school, it actually has a school population which broadly reflects the wider community in which it's geographically placed, which is very, very welcome. But Minister, in your statement, you also refer to investment and maintenance works, both capital and minor. I wonder, had you 
even at this early stage, any sense of how much that might be? And would you uh, give any thought to looking at the process by which school principals can uh, uh, requisition some minor works, which does seem to be unduly cumbersome, bureaucratic and costly? Broadly speaking, the, the overall capital investment will be, as I said, a mix of new, new build, maintenance and SEP. I think there's still some thought and decision to be taken about what the precise nature of that, that mix is. Uh, look, I think the member makes a very good point in terms of issues around autonomy, particularly around procurement. Uh, I think that's one of the areas that we will want to look at to ensure that uh, there's always the balance by trying to ensure that we get the maximum value for public money, but by the same token then that we don't necessarily micromanage. And I think that there is a, a strong case. Uh, I think that um, it is also the case in looking ahead uh, on that issue, it is about giving people opportunities uh, for levels of autonomy. Because previously, I think whenever uh, I was minister, we'd put out a, a fairly open questionnaire on the issue of autonomy to schools. And there is, even from schools in very similar positions, sometimes a very mixed opinion. Because some schools will take a view of, well, actually, they don't want any additional burden, and effectively, could somebody else not just sort that, that out for them, uh, whereas other schools are much more keener to embrace. So I think it's about trying to work out a system where we can give, within the, the context of, um, as I said, value for money, uh, that level of opportunities for uh, autonomy in a very sensible way. And I think that clearly involves the levels of procurement and maintenance. Okay, thank you. And I call Roy Beggs. I too would wish to congratulate the Minister on his, uh, his appointment and wish him well. But there are huge pressures on school budgets, and this is particularly the case where there has, there has been uh, school amalgamations and schools continue to operate on multiple sites. So looking at the Minister's statements, he's indicated some 59 schools over a three-year period have benefited from £145 million. So could the Minister advise how this along with the new, the new build programme, prioritises and encourages school amalgamations, which can bring about improvements to educational outcomes to our children and young people, and also bring about savings for the department. And at the same time, Minister, can you give me an update on the progress in the redevelopment of Isla McGee Primary School, which has already taken over a decade? Okay, I'll be happy, to, uh, first of all, on the last point, obviously I don't have direct details here in connection with Island Miggy, but I'll be happy to write to the member on that. Uh, I don't know whether he was briefly excited when he saw the announcement, because it, there was reference to Carrick Primary School, and of course that's in, in Lurgan uh, on that basis, but not within the, the member's constituency. Uh, in terms of, the member makes a very, very good point in terms of the, the broader um, rationalisation of the school estate and indeed where we have, for instance, mergers. And I think one of the issues in connection with that, I think, which we'll be looking in terms of transformation side of it, quite often a merger can lead to a, a better longer term solution. But members will also be aware that quite often when a merger, and particularly where there's a split site, uh, can create particularly a lot of upfront costs. So I think we need to look particularly from a transformation point of view in connection with that. Can I say, um, I suppose, in terms of it playing uh, a role within the decision-making process, mention was made, I think, that these were decided on the existing protocol. As part of that protocol, um, there are a range of priorities that are built into that. Uh, amongst those will be um, the enhancement works that are essential to affect rationalization projects, so as part of, if you like, a wider uh, area plan. Uh, and indeed, there's also, I think, where it is, um, uh, where there are, for instance, split sites to ensure that, that, that actually things can be brought together can also be part of that. So uh, we're looking at sort of where there's unmet needs, where there's significant substandard accommodation. I think what we need to ensure, and I think this has been happening by the department, but ensure that uh, as we move ahead, for instance, on area planning, that there's, uh, particularly in terms of major capital works, that, that we have an alignment that, that, if you like, that there's a that it's in step with the wider position of trying to ensure that we get a, the best overall uh, layout of, of, uh, of schools as part of the, the overall position. Okay, thank you. I'll call Trevor Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And like others, can I welcome the Minister to and in recent to his appointment and indeed his statement here today. Um, 
mention, uh, Minister, in terms of the 18 schools, in terms of the school enhancement, and I, obviously I would welcome uh, the investment in Riverside, where I had the opportunity to go in June last year, where much of investment would be required. However, and I appreciate, Minister, the statement is relatively short today, um, and you won't have the detail possibly with you today if you get uh, right to me in relation to further detail on what Riverside is to receive, because given that it is a special school and the nature of that school, it is a very difficult location and the, a very cramped location. So if I could ask the Minister if he could get us more detail in relation to what that is. And also, can I say when I'm on the feet, as others have used the opportunity in a parochial manner to discuss Crumlin Integrated and extend an invitation to the Minister to Crumlin, um, where they're coming under difficulty from the Education Authority currently, and it's a school currently that's... Uh, there's over a thousand uh, pupils leaving Crumlin daily to go to other schools, and we would like to see the long-term viability of Crumlin sustain. sustain. Certainly, uh, in relation to that, I mean, first of all, we'd be happy to correspond with the, the member in terms of uh, Riverside. Again, in terms of uh, other invitations, I'll be happy to try to accommodate. I, I fear um, that we may have to sort of speak to the people of the technology to, to clone Dolly the sheep, because they may need to be in several places at several times uh, in connection with school visits. But certainly, we will take every offer and try and accommodate as much as possible in terms of the, the school visits. And I appreciate that there will be a range of schools that some of which put in for this particular uh, school enhancement programme, others that didn't. Um, the, uh, the opportunity as such will be taken to, uh, there will be other opportunities for other schools as well as part of that. Okay. Thank you. And I call Sinead Annis. <laughs> Good. Uh, can call your, uh, I too welcome the announcement today of funding for the schools that have, have been listed, but um, it would be remiss of me, and I think conspicuous by its absence, or uh, one, one school in particular of my own constituency of South Down, which is St Louis Grammar in Kilkeel, um, a school that is in dire need of capital investment, major capital investment, and I too extend an invitation to the, to the Minister to pay, to pay a visit to St Louis to see uh, the situation there uh, at the campus. Um, you allude in your statement um, that you intend to continue the advancement of the, the programme of major capital bills. Can I ask the Minister when will he announce the next tranche of funding for capital projects so that schools like St Louis, uh, Inkle Kale and the Lower Moor there can actually avail of that, get their business case in order and, uh, and, and avail of the next tranche of funding? From that point of view, I suppose there's, there's a couple of issues because uh, I appreciate also that there will be schools that will have, as indicated, I think, mentioned, I think possibly 165 schools initially put in, so we've seen tranches uh, happening. First of all, I, I think the, the current prioritised list is due to expire in May, but I'll give consideration as to whether or not there should be a further tranche of SEPs uh, announced by then or whether we look to sort of a, a new call as part of that. Mention I've obviously made of, of minor capital works. I, I would hope that in terms of prioritising potential projects for major capital works to make an announcement in the coming months um, in relation to that. I think it's also the case that because we have effectively uh, these categories, um, clearly if you like there's a ceiling of, and the way they are sort of subcategorised, there's a ceiling of four million um, on uh, an SEP. Uh, sometimes there will then be, and clearly for example, if there is either by way of a major new build that would be above that, uh, it may be that for the city school may feel that it is not appropriate to put in for that particular bit, that they may look simply towards, towards capital. So it's, it's, it's a certain amount of horses for courses on that, on that basis. Uh, although there is also the case that a school can put in for both a school enhancement programme and can also apply for major, uh, a major capital works as, as well. So all those will be assessed and we hope within the, the coming months that we can actually move on major capital projects. But it will be a completely open process where people then can apply um, on that basis. Before I call the next speaker, could I just remind members that there are quite a number of speakers due to speak and requesting to speak, and we won't go through them at this rate, so I'm just letting people know that I could try and keep the remarks as briefly as possibly can do. Thank you. So I'll call on Kelly Armstrong. Mr Speaker, I will try to be brief. Um, thank the Minister very much um, for telling the public that we actually have money that can be spent on our schools that are in crisis, and welcome him, of course, back into his ministry. Um, I'm delighted that there are a number of schools that it, are in our constituency, such as Kalinchia and Glastry. <coughs> Much needed work needs to be done there. Um, but the Minister talks about this immediate impact, and I know it could take a bit of time for this to happen, but um, we need to think also towards the long-term delivery of investment. All this needs to be fed into the written branch review of education that we have agreed on in the New Deal document. Um, so what I want to ask is, how will the Minister do that to ensure that that's fed through? How many schools that have already applied 
um, and had it been awarded money, probably under the permanent secretary, are yet to receive funding. And if you could, at some stage, publish the funding that each school re receives. Thank well, you. Uh, I suppose taking each of those in, in turn. In terms of the, the, the wider picture, obviously, there's in terms of any um, examination of reform, it will have to be of a holistic nature. There's no point in different aspects of that going in, in sort of a silo route. And so, consequently, anything, for instance, looked at, um, and while a lot of this will probably focus on educational structures, on resource finances, the capital then has got to, to marry in with that. Uh, in terms of the uh, issue of the, where the state of play is with each of the existing ones, obviously I've made reference to the, the um, earlier sort of provision, and I'm sure an update can be provided on where each of the individual schools in, in earlier tranches, I think uh, that can be, uh, perhaps we can produce that and uh, lay that within the assembly library. Uh, in terms of the individual amounts, uh, we're still at a stage where the detail of that, there will be a certain amount of work that will go on because, again, part of that is a, going to be a certain level of ongoing discussion in terms of the project with the schools. So I'm conscious of the fact that, that uh, if we were saying here's a very definitive amount for each school, that may end up giving a false impression. It may underestimate sometimes what, what money will be. The only thing I would say for absolute certainty uh, is that uh, all school housing projects will be between half a million and, and four million. As members can suggest, that the fact that we were talking about a tranche of money of 45 million across 18 schools, uh -huh. it will tend to be on the higher side of, of that in general. Uh, but obviously, as individual details become available uh, and agreed, that will then become transparent um, between the department and the schools. Thank you. And I call Kiva Archibald. And like others, can I congratulate the Minister on his appointment to his position and um, also welcome today's announcement. Um, just in relation to an answer to a previous question about um, new transitional funding um, for capital programmes, schools in need of capital, um, major capital investment may be inclined and understandably so to apply under the schools enhancement programme. Um, would this have any impact on an application for major capital works? In terms of the, the situation, of certainly no, scar, no school is, is barred uh, from applying uh, for both. And indeed, even if there's a school enhancement programme, that also doesn't automatically rule them out. Obviously, in terms of the broader capital, uh, capital works, there are a range of factors which are built into any protocol, one of which will clearly be the, uh, the physical state of the buildings, the level of facilities that are there. So I suppose to some extent the, the, there's always some level of impact because it may mean that any scoring mechanism, for instance, on the physical state of any, uh, maybe, just checking that that is correct, or maybe, uh, maybe not, just give me a moment here. There will be a, sorry, there, there is ultimately uh, a situation that if a school has been approved for an SEP, it was likely to lead to a period of time in which they wouldn't be eligible. Uh, I think normally, the normal rule of thumb is I think a seven year period in, in relation to that. And obviously again, in terms of the wider context, people will look at, as I said, that's not to say that schools can't apply for both, but clearly if they're successful, to some extent, there will be a, a certain amount where schools will have to take a little bit of a strategic decision themselves in terms of, um, you know, sometimes what they feel to be best. Sometimes that will be obvious because a school may not be necessarily looking for a complete new build. It may be looking and feeling, well, actually, we feel that we do need additional classrooms or we need uh, within that, because one of the other, I suppose, drawbacks, sometimes can be an advantage, but drawbacks for a school if it's looking at a complete capital build is that it will look to, uh, there will be a, a site search, so it may not by any means necessarily end up where it is at present. Uh, I suppose the SEP is given assurance that, that the work can carry on and that indeed the school will remain uh, at, its, at its current location, which also gives a certain level of certainty for the way ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, call Pat Cadney. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Minister, I, I wish to, like everyone else here, wish you the best of luck in your portfolio as the Education Minister and uh, every success in that going forward. Um, I uh, wish to thank the officials uh, that have been meeting with me over the uh, one school that was here today, St John the Baptist. It borders on my constituency, but I was asked by parents when I go in and meet with the Board of Governors and with the, um, 
with, with the school. And I am delighted that this is now being put forward as a school enhancement project. Little St John the Baptist has half of its school closed. And Minister, I don't want to infringe on your time, but if at all possible, you will see what that will do and how it will transform that whole area. With that school being closed down and with the vandalism and what our children have to try and to go there, my question is, in the enveloping of that school, can we try to I know you, your officials will try to keep it to as minimum a time and as minimum a, of disruption as possible. Certainly, I mean, first of all, I would pay tribute, I think, to the, the member. I know he's been particularly assiduous in um, raising the case as regards to John, John the Baptist. Uh, and I think that a lot of the work as regards to school, I would pay credit to him. Uh, I should also highlight, I think, given the appointment of the new principal, St John the Baptist, not just given this so we get a favourable response from a social media commentator, uh, but what I would say, I hope the, the, like the, uh, the original St John the Baptist, this is the forerunner of, of better things as well. Certainly as regards, uh, and I am sure the member will be assiduous in ensuring that the envelope is pushed out as much as possible uh, in connection with this. Again, it is about the aim is to try to deliver these as quickly as we possibly can uh, on that basis. There will be no undue delay, but obviously we want to have, from the department's point of view, uh, a clear level of discussion. Uh, with the, with the school on the exact details then of, of what will be provided. Okay, thank you. Can I call Orlea Flynn? Can call you and can I also send my congratulations to Mr Weir on your appointment as Minister for the Department of Education. Um, I welcome the statement from the Minister today, particularly in relation to the investment that's coming into St Cairns and St John the Baptist Schools in West Belfast. Um, I'd also like to thank the, the Speaker of the House, as I know he was involved in, in some of that work with St John Baptist School um, locally. So my question is, can the Minister please outline um, when the work to these two schools um, will commence, please? Well, as, as indicated um, earlier, we have an overall timescale. We don't have the detail because that will, some of that will involve um, the wider discussions between that. We're hoping that in terms of the school enhancement programme that the uh, people will be on site in 22-23 and that indeed the, the normal time scale was roughly about 18 months. There, there can be a fairly quick turnaround in terms of construction with SEP compared within that. And I think, again, one of the advantages is, again, depending upon the exact nature of the work that's being done, in the vast majority of cases, it should mean that there isn't any particular levels of dislocation. Um, you know, I can't give a guarantee that in every school there may need to be some temporary relocation, but the fact that it's on site, the fact that it will be part of the school, should mean that we can minimise the level of disruption uh, for any of the schools. And again, I look forward to new facilities, both at St John's and St Cairns. I, I, I'm looking forward to the refreshing bit of maybe somebody getting up and welcoming a, a school outside their own constituency. I suppose to be fair, uh, Pat Catney, to be fair to him, I suppose, as a member for Lagan Valley, did break that taboo and, and uh, welcomed the school in, in West Belfast. Uh, so he should perhaps get a, a special speaker's prize as a result of uh, today. <laughs> I'll consider that in due course. Okay, I'm going to call Meg Nesbitt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I join the chorus of congratulations to Mr. Weir on his reappointment as minister. He has given uh, some detail of the plan for Glastry College, the likely time scales, uh, and the correlation between receiving uh, school enhancement programme money and being granted money for a new build. Uh, on that basis, can I ask uh, whether Glastry is still in line for a new build? and declaring an interest as chair of the board of Movilla, if there are any implications in today's announcement for area planning in Ards and North Down. I, these are taken, first of all, in relation to that. Yes, I've, I've highlighted, if you like, the, the timescale. Obviously, again, I would make the case, and I'm, I'm not making any particular assumptions in relation to the two schools that, that have been particularly mentioned. Uh, what I've highlighted in terms of the uh, particular details of the project is on the basis of referring to what the school put in in its application and indeed what the asks were. Uh, in most cases, that will be then reflected precisely in the, the school enhancement programme, but there will be some occasions because it's on the basis of what the needs of the school uh, would be. Uh, from the point of view, um, obviously, as mentioned, the normal process where there is a school enhancement programme, there will be maybe a bar on, uh, on an application, successful application for new build. But we will want to look at everything in the wider context of area planning. In terms of Movilla, uh, again, uh, there will be a wider context will need to be looked at in terms of, of area planning, and we will be coming back to that at a, 
at a later stage uh, in connection with that. Uh, Obviously, if there's a development proposal that comes forward, there will need to be a reassessment just to make sure that, that is fit for purpose. And again, sometimes, as I said, what a school says it wants may not necessarily be the absolute priority of what, what it needs. And sometimes that can even be found whenever the project is actually underway, that sometimes priorities will also change a little bit. Thank you. And I call Carl Nikillen. And also congratulate the Minister for Education. I am going to congratulate him on investment in Clevenville Controlled Primary School in North Belfast, the integrated school. It's very much welcomed. The Minister mentioned earlier, I think it was in relation to an answer to Dolores Kelly around procurement. I would like to see strengthening procurement procedures where it isn't um, a case where if you go through the CPD route, that you spent more money replacing your minor works and fixtures that if you, you, you done it independently. And I would ask the Minister, through <coughs> enhanced procedures with CPD, SIB and others, that he bring something forward, because it is significant money that's been invested in welcome money. But, uh, but it's certainly the procurement up until now needs to be tightened up and it needs to be more cost effective and certainly more inclusive of social clauses and social benefits as well. Yeah, I, I take the point that the, the members make, and obviously sometimes as regards to the wider issue of procurement, it will be something which lies outside largely the remit of my department. I know particularly um, in terms of CPD, it, it, it tends to be as it largely lies within the Department of Finance. So there's, there's, you know, we've got to ensure across public, but I think we've got to be careful that we don't talk across purposes. There's clearly got to be, for any major levels of, of procurement, very clear cut um, regulations, very clear-cut uh, procedures that are there. I suppose where there can be a level of annoyance, and again where we need to, to look at this from the point of view of schools, where schools are seeing something that's a very minor thing to do and they see at times a long lead-in time, potentially uh, a situation in which they see what seems to be relatively minor work then seem to cost a large amount of money. So it's about, it's about getting that level of balance probably at, at the lower level. Obviously, I think from what the member said, particularly in terms of if we're looking at major areas of procurement, that's something that is something that should be uh, universal throughout government and try to ensure there's a level playing field in connection with that. Okay, thank you. I call Paula Bradshaw. Okay, th thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I um, echo the congratulations to um, Mr. Weir and, and his appointment, and also congratulate my colleague Chris Little, who's taken over as chair of the education. Um, I, was, I was delighted today to see uh, Botanic Primary School and Victoria College included in, in that list. Very conscious that Victoria College is one of um, a, a large number of um, post-primary schools in my constituency that. Ha have the, capa have the capacity, if given additional funding for works like this, to take on more um, pupils. Um, in the last academic year, there were 200 pupils who weren't allocated their first choice, and at the end of the day, there were seven who didn't get a point, um, allocated a place at all. You mentioned, Minister, about um, the protocol and the, the principal criteria under it in terms of um, amalgamation and split sites. And I'm just wondering if you're minded to change the protocol to reflect where there are pressures, um, such as I've outlined there, to allow for more pupils to be taken on. Thank you. Well, as regards obviously the protocol mentioned in terms of split sites, um, I think the fact that Victoria College in particular is operating on split sites is one of the factors which obviously was a part of the determinant in. Uh, reaching out. I think if, if it helps, if you like, uh, create a more sustainable school um, estate, I think is, is, is preferable in relation to that. Uh, you know, there will need to be, I think, as we look at the broader area of school numbers to ensure that we get the right processes there, particularly for development proposals. I, I'll not, uh, the member may appreciate that in terms of commenting on an individual case, that wouldn't be something, I, I appreciate that, that more generally. Uh, obviously, we, we've got to ensure that the um, the situation with regard to development rules are fit for purpose. And sometimes that means that we look at things uh, and maybe see where there can be some easier wins. In some cases, there's been a situation where, and again, I know the department's been proactive on this, that on the converse, there will be some schools that have had an artificial enrolment number, which actually doesn't reflect uh, the reality of the situation. Maybe some decision that was taken in the 70s and 80s. So there has been, I think, accommodation in terms of downsizing. Clearly, with any individual proposal, um, we look at the overall system. In relation, I think that's got to feed in, will be part as well of the wider review, because I think that, that how we manage that and the processes, I think, 
play into area planning. Obviously, with regards to individual applications, um, I am under a legal duty then to determine each of those on the merits of that, that case, so I will not comment on the individual, uh, which I, I assume the member would not expect me to anyway. Okay, thank you. Call Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I welcome you to your new role and also welcome the Minister back into his role. And Minister, may I first of all thank you for a job you did three years ago, just prior to the collapse of these institutions at Clockhor School, and you kindly accepted my request to visit, and those works have taken place. So I would like to put on record my thanks to you and also put on record my appreciation to Derek Baker, who has done a tremendous job in a very challenging situation over the last few years in the Department of Education. Uh, Minister, just to uh, draw on so there's many points that have been made in relation to uh, monies awarded to schools. Uh, my, mine is focused on Strabane Primary School. Uh, it, again, it's a former school of mine. I attended it 20 short years ago. Uh, and uh, since then, it hasn't changed very much uh, whatsoever. Uh, and it was in line for a new school minister. And, and uh, I know that there was hopes that that would be the case. And I'm wondering, Minister, uh, will that still be the case, uh, dependent on the level of grant that's given to, or funding that's given to the school, or will this simply replace uh, that proposal that was originally made? And also, just before I finish, the former principal retired this year. He gave 38 years uh, of his life to uh, the children in Strabane, uh, Mr. David Canning, and he was the principal of that school for 26 years. So I'd like to put on record my appreciation to him as well. Thank you. No, and I think uh, I would. Echo a couple of points that the member has made. I mean, first of all, I think it is right that we do pay tribute to some of our retiring teachers and principals, many of whom have spent perhaps decades at particular schools, have seen perhaps generations of children uh, go through that. Uh, I would also, I think, echo, and it would be remiss of me not to say that, uh, you know, without getting into any of the recriminations of the last three years, um, the fact that despite the limitations that have been placed upon them, there's been a lot of good work put in by officials from all departments. Um, in relation to trying to ensure that as much progress is made as, as possible. I too can remember the, um, the visit to West Tyrone. I think it, it was a little bit of a Storm Brendan type situation because I remember we, were, uh, we might have had to uh, almost sort of borrow the, um, uh, the leader of the All Students Party's former submarine to get back that, that day. Such, so heavy was the, the waters on that particular occasion. Um, can I say, you know, a, an indication of that, as, as indicated, if there's been a successful SEP, the general rule is that it will prevent for a period of time uh, a, a complete new build. However, there can be the opportunity to effectively um, obtain that via the other, the other route. And I think, obviously, in Straban's case, a lot of the uh, focus will be on issues around new classrooms and, indeed, extension of that. And hopefully, then, there'll be... I, I hope to be back in the members' constituency visiting schools, hopefully in but drier circumstances. Okay, thank you, and I call Sean Lynch. Can I call you? And I welcome Minister's statement and wish him well in the post. I am somewhat disappointed that there are no Gale school on, a, on the list. It may be that none applied. I understand there will be other opportunities for schools to apply, and I hope that the Minister will be inclusive of all sectors, including the Irish language sector. Look, it's, from that point of view, I don't know uh, all indications where I think 165 schools applied. In some cases, uh, as indicated, a range of schools. I mean, it's undoubtedly the case, uh, and again, others can bear this out, that if you are visiting schools around the country, I'm sure there's a lot more schools would feel that they would be in a position that um, they would benefit from either a new build or an SEP. In some cases, that decision will have been taken by the school as to which route they see as the more appropriate in connection with that. The criteria are entirely objective uh, within that. Uh, schools are scored around those, those criteria and then, if you like, ranked according to the list. The only subdivision uh, is not between any form of sectors, but between primary, to get a mix of primary, post-primary, and uh, some indication of special needs schools. So, quite frankly, irrespective of the sector that any school applies from, uh, they're scored entirely by officials entirely on the basis of those objective uh, criteria, and that will continue to be the case. Thank you. And I call uh, Phil McGuigan. Uh, and can I congratulate uh, you on your appointment 
uh, to Minister of Education. And just to alert you to the fact that I have sent you an email uh, uh, requesting an urgent meeting about a proposed school closure of Barnish Primary School in my constituency, and I hope you look on that, that request favourably. Can I welcome uh, your statement uh, here this, this, uh, this morning and the investment of £45 million into our, our schools estate? In particular, can I welcome the investment in St Louis Grammar School in Ballymena, my own constituency? I was just checking over it. Uh, I did a meeting with uh, the Permanent Secretary and, and Department officials at the beginning of 2018 uh, about the much-needed work at St Louis and uh, much need of a new canteen, outdoor sports facilities, repairs of uh, windows and doors throughout the school. Uh, and can I ask the Minister if he can confirm that this is the work that will be uh, allocated to St Louis and also if he could confirm when the school will uh, get the full allocation of the money uh, given to it? Well, as indicated, as with all the proposals, uh, there is an overall timescale for the SEP, so I, I can't go into the individual school in terms of um, their time, because, again, that will slightly vary depending upon the discussions. Uh, again, in terms of what the requests were, it is highlighted in a very similar manner to what the, the member asked for in terms of canteen, in terms of, uh, I think, sort of some replacement in terms of windows and security, and also looking at, at uh, in terms of sports facilities as well. So those are the, the requests, and we'll be working uh, with them on that. I, I must just make a slightly reminder, I think, of the, the phrase that, uh, and I appreciate the, the work that the member's done, that, uh, that uh, victory has, has a thousand parents and defeat is an orphan. So uh, there's a lot of um, good work being put in by a range of members uh, across the, the spectrum on a range of, of these. Specifically, obviously, as regards you mentioned about the potential school closure, I will take advice in terms of I um, don't know what stage that, that is at. Uh, and the member will appreciate that, that legally there are periods where uh, a minister, in terms of a development proposal, uh, can sort of meet and take listen to submissions, hear advice, it's because the Minister will be, and in the absence of the Minister of the Department, will be taking a final decision, they can't they can comment on that. There will also be a period where the Minister is prevented from having that, that meeting, so I will need to look at that individual case, uh, you know, depending on where it is within the process. Thank you. And a call from McCann. I'll get uh, Kion Kolya, and I would like to congratulate yourself on your elevation to the post of Speaker and also the, 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 the Minister on his reappointment uh, to, to the post, and I look forward uh, to a meeting at the earliest possible convenience to discuss some concerns that I have in the input. And in relation to the statement, I think it's, it's, it's very welcome, especially in, in, in terms of St Paul's Primary School in, in Maca Drive. And, in its own way, it's a unique school. Over 25 per cent of the pupils come from the rich culture and ethnic backgrounds that, that exist within the area, and it enhances everybody's education within the area. Uh, 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 but what I would ask is, and I know that you have been pressed here this morning that to give timelines and dates and things, but is it possible that the Minister could ask whoever in the Department, if they could correspond with me, uh, a timeline uh, for work to begin in, in, in that school? Well, I think obviously we will be responding, and again, um, thank the member for his, his, his question. Uh, the member will know, obviously, the constraints of finances of former members of the, the old DFP committee uh, that he was on in, in connection with that. In terms of, obviously, the initial level of correspondence and direct contact will be between the department and the schools. Uh, obviously, I think there will be a need to keep the wider community sort of involved with that. I had the opportunity, I remember, in visiting St Paul's because it is, um, as you say, sort of a particular um, significant mix of, of, of people, which I think works very well within the, within the school. Uh, and obviously, as part of that, we we'll want to make sure that that can progress. Uh, the scheme at St Paul's, as with others, can progress as, as soon as possible. But obviously, as well, if the members uh, will be able to respond to any correspondence the member uh, gives us. Okay, thank you. And I call Patty McGlone. Um, I guess, um, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. And I first of all would congratulate the minister. Um, on his appointment to this department. Um, I have no doubt he will perform his duties as, as assiduously as before, so I congratulate him on that. Um, in relation to uh, St Patrick's College Mahara, I have been in regular contact with the school, had visits, and indeed I would like to commend your officials who did take the time to come out and meet with the school principal 
and Chair of the Board of Governors and uh, Councillor Martin Kearney on site to see the actualities of the school itself. So, um, I would, if you could convey that, thanks on to the officials for their time and commitment, please, Minister. Um, uh, we've heard uh, some degree of detail around the commencement date, but if I could, and perhaps you'd uh, wish to, to write me about uh, this, Minister, if you could provide me with details of the works which have now been approved for it and the level of financial commitment to those works as well, please. So I'd be happy to correspond with the, the member. Um, as indicated earlier, uh, this has been, if you like, stage one. It's, it's the, the approval, but the next stage then is a scoping out of the project between the department and the, the school. So the exact amount, and even, even once, once work starts, there can be a degree of variation on, on that. Uh, I think that once that project work has been done in terms of uh, that scoping exercise, we're in a better position then to provide a little more meat on the bone over directly what will be done and what it's likely to, to cause. I, I seem to remember, I think, visiting St. Patrick's College possibly with the member previously um, in relation to it. And in part, that was an opportunity to, to see the particular uh, state of the buildings that were there. And it's good, therefore, that we're seeing sort of in terms of some of the provisions, a, a good news story as regards St. Pat's. Okay. Thank you. And I'll call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I wish to extend my welcome to this announcement today by the Minister and also welcome him back to the post. I am um, certainly glad to see three schools in North Down area to be included in this scheme as, a well, as well as across the board. And it was, as previous speakers have said, we do have much to do in terms of addressing the education issues we face here. I certainly hope to work alongside the Minister, especially to address the backlog of minor works which are much needed across the estate and, as the Minister will know, have continued to pile up. I would like to ask if the proposed advancement of minor works will address the, the current backlog of projects first and how much would be made available through this? Well, again, it's part of the, and again, welcome, I think I'm, I'm right in saying perhaps the, uh, the members of former pupil, possibly of Sullivan Upper, uh, and therefore I so would be particularly delighted to see her old school uh, getting um, advantage of this. Uh, what I would say, yes, in terms of the, the minor works, some of that will also then be dependent upon what budget is available. And there's a decision also to be taken uh, because it's, 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 to some extent there are three areas. There are the school enhancement programme, there's the major capital bill, and there's minor works. And so there's a wee bit of thought to be given as to what the right concoction between the three uh, would be. It's undoubtedly the case in terms of overall capital works, um, including minor works, that the budget itself, while it's very welcome to see um, actions being taken, it may be less pressed than the resource budget but again could be spent two or three times over at least in that, in that regard. But certainly I think we'll be coming back to try and ensure that the, there is that right mix between all those elements. Okay, uh, thank you. I'll call Jim Allister. Um, can I express my disappointment at the neglect of the controlled sector in North Antrim and indeed in the entirety of County Antrim? It seems there hasn't been any controlled school in the entirety of County Antrim found worthy of these improvements. What a contrast for County Down uh, and the Minister's own constituency, past and present, where uh, four such schools uh, are to be uh, advanced. Uh, is there a particular reason why County Antrim is being ignored? And since there's been well, since there's been 165 applicants and still over 100 schools waiting, will the Minister publish the list of those who are still waiting for inclusion in this scheme? Uh, finally, could I join with Mrs Kelly in urging upon the Minister speedy action to restore autonomy to individual schools on minor works? It is preposterous that when you have a broken window, a broken door, you have to go on, you, you can't simply get it fixed as you could before. And the expense to the public purse is escalating. Uh, it would be perhaps surprising if the member wasn't expressing some level of disappointment at whatever was being said. Uh, can I say, obviously, uh, it may have skipped the member's notice that, for instance, uh, Riverside School in Antrim is in County Antrim. And you will find, uh, I I appreciate that a friend of mine has an expression, every day is a school day. It may actually surprise the member to actually realise that it is also a controlled school on that, on that basis. And indeed, as part of the overall picture, there are uh, 10 out of the 18 schools are from the controlled sector on that basis. 
and indeed the boundaries of County Antrim will also include some of those, for instance, within Belfast, uh, fall within County Antrim. Um, and without getting a lesson in, in geography in, in relation. In terms of the selection of these, these are done by rigorous um, objective criteria which have been applied by uh, officials. Now, I did not seek in any way to interfere with those or adjust the list in any shape or form in relation to it because I think it's, it's important that those are there fair and objectively. And it will mean that within any tranche, some schools will be successful and others won't. In terms of the uh, publication of any list, I suspect that uh, I'll consult with officials that may well be that uh, that is not the basis upon which schools put in on that, that basis, but I will, I will contact the member in terms of what the level of, of uh, discussion can be. And it may well be that from a geographical point of view, on a particular occasion, one area will be of benefit, another area will benefit, and that is on the basis then of objective, objective criteria, and that's the way it should be. Okay, thank you. And I'll call uh, Clara Sugden as our final speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And like others, I will congratulate the Minister. I think his appointment in particular is probably the most critical to provide continuity to what is going to be a very worryingly short mandate in the time that we have left. Um, I suppose generally I, I get quite frustrated um, in how government spends money. Um, more often than not, it feels like we are firefighting, trying to uh, deal with the issues that present ourselves, and, and we're quite reactionary, when really we should be trying to focus on investing to save so that we can actually hopefully try and save some money. And indeed, if the Prime Minister isn't forthcoming with the money that we had hoped, that's something that all government ministers will have to have a keen focus on. So can I ask the Minister, is he considering the hemorrhaging of resources that many schools have, and it's a point that I wish to pick up from Ms Bradshaw and Mr Beggs around the multi-split school sites when he's considering capital investments. I appreciate there's two different funding pots, but I think we need to look at this strategically if we're going to actually start uh, getting somewhere with this issue. I, I, don't, I don't in any way disagree with the, the, the member, and I think it's part of the wider picture. I think capital investment has got to be aligned with the overall position. I think we need to see as I said, a levels of reform and transformation, and some of that will mean within the school estate. Uh, it may well be that, as the member mentioned, that there's a certain level of invest to save, that, that through that transformation there may need to be certain money to put up front to produce both better financial and better educational uh, facilities. Uh, we shouldn't also kid ourselves that if we are looking at transformation of the, the broader school estate, sometimes that will mean difficult decisions of why people can buy into a wider picture, perhaps whenever it gets to their own individual area. Uh, there it is human nature they'll be a lot more protective and supportive of that, that particular side of things. But it is, the member is right in terms of providing a more strategic vision and something which is more long term in its approach. Okay, thank you. And that concludes questions on the statement. I have received notice from the Minister of Health that he wishes to make a statement. So I'm going to invite uh, Minister Robin Swan. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I am grateful for the opportunity to be able to make a statement to the Assembly on the industrial action in the Health and Social Care Service and the work to hopefully bring this to an end. As this has been a fast-moving situation, I apologise to the Assembly for not providing the usually advanced sight of this statement. As this is my first time addressing the House as Minister, I want to take the opportunity to reassure the Assembly, Health and Social Care staff and members of the public that I absolutely recognise the challenges that are facing our health service. Too many patients have been waiting for far too long, and our staff, on which the health service is totally dependent, have become increasingly frustrated and demoralised. It is as a result of those daunting and unprecedented challenges that I stand in front of you as Minister. There is no issue more important than the health and well-being of our people, and I hope that by picking this department, we were able to demonstrate our absolute commitment to tackling and resolving the difficulties that our health service is facing. Of course, whilst the problems are well known, we must not forget that each and every day, our health service continues to perform extraordinary work in often incredibly difficult circumstances. That is why I especially wish to pay tribute to all our health and social care workers. There are over 70,000 people employed by the HSC and a similar number working in the independent sector. Their work is vitally important, and I wish to thank each and every one of them for the talent, effort, and dedication they bring, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. 
The circumstances, Mr. Speaker, that led to the unprecedented industrial action by SS HSE staff on agen agenda for change terms and conditions were hugely regrettable. And I fully appreciate the frustrations and distresses which have led to that point. I know that it will have been extremely hard, the decision for many of those to take industrial action, but I understand the reasons why they did. I will shortly outline the measures that the Executive will take to try and bring the industrial action to an end, but I will begin by explaining the background. Agenda for Change is the national pay system for all NHS and HSC staff, with the exception of doctors, dentists and the more senior executives. It was introduced in 2004. A refresh of Agenda for Change was formally ratified at the NHS Staff Council in 2018, where it was agreed, in conjunction with trade unions, to implement a three-year pay deal covering the period from 1 April 2018 to 31 March 2021 as well as reform of the pay structure and changes to terms and conditions. In the absence of ministers, the Department of Health was unable to implement the three-year deal, as it was in the other parts of the UK. However, the Department has been engaging with HSC employers and trade unions on Agenda for Change refresh for Northern Ireland. At the end of 2018, a pay award, whilst not agreed with unions, was implemented. It mirrored the first of the three-year pay deal agreed in England. Basically, it was the same uplift, adding 3% to the pay bill, albeit from a starting point 1% lower than in England. Despite significant engagement throughout 2019, which included over 20 meetings between department, HSC employers and trade unions, no agreement was made with trade unions on the two-year 2019-2020 pay offer. Pay parity together with safe staffing, are the main causes of the current dispute. Two formal offers have so far been made for 2019 and 2020. However, these were both rejected by trade unions, as neither of them restored parity with England. Both the pay award for 2018-19, which added 3% to the pay bill, and the most recent offer made for this year, which would have added 3.1% to the pay bill, need to be viewed in the wider context of public sector pay in Northern Ireland, where pay increases were in the region of 1%. The developing pay dispute, together with trade union concerns on safe staffing, have caused the four larger, largest Agenda for Change trade unions in Northern Ireland, the Royal College for Nursing, Unilson, Unite and NIPSA, to commence formal balloting of their members for industrial action up to and including strike action. Ballots in favour of industrial action were passed by all four unions, and Unison commenced industrial action in late November, with action short of strike across a number of sites. This industrial action escalated across the region involving members of all four unions, with a strike on the 18th of December 2019, and a further two days of strike action by the RCN on the 8th and 10th of January 2020, and Unison on the 10th of January. Importantly, members should also remain mindful that other Agenda for Change unions, unions are balloting or shortly intend to ballot their members. The industrial action caused the cancellation of thousands of outpatient and elective appointments across Northern Ireland. And without resolution to this dispute, trade unions have stated that the action will escalate further. Three days of strike action by the RCN are scheduled on the 20th, 22nd and 24th of January, with further days scheduled in February and March. Pay parity has been a consistent theme throughout the industrial action. Over the last number of years, England and Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland have each adopted a different approach to pay, resulting in the pay values no longer being identical in each of the four jurisdictions. Scotland's agenda for change pay values are higher than those in England, which in turn are higher than those in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland's break in pay parity with England occurred in 2015-16 following a decision in January 2015. Turning members and speaker to the resolution of the dispute, applying England's pay values to current pay scales in Northern Ireland, with effect from the 1st of April 2019, will create pay parity with England. This is estimated to cost £109 million. The Department has, through a combination of in-year easements and successful bids for additional funding, been able to assemble £79 million. 50 million of which is non-recurrent funding, 
to increase pay for this staff grouping for 2019-2020. Therefore, an additional €30 million is required to meet the costs of Agenda for Change pay parity with England in 2019-2020. A move to pay, pay parity will, of course, also have implications for our budget in future years. It should be noted that a further £67 million of recurrent funding will also be necessary in 2021 to support national living wage uplifts. And if pay recommendations for other staff groups not covered by Agenda for Change, such as Family Health Services and Doctors and Dentists Review Body recommendations, are to be met, a move to parity with England will not inherently address recruitment and retention problems in Northern Ireland. Whilst there are over 7,000 vacancies currently being recruited for in the HSC, the high number is due to a range of factors. For example, the outworkings of the transformation agenda and the creation of new staff mixes in HSC, the ever-increasing size of the workforce necessary to attempt to keep pace with the demands of a growing and ageing population, and shortages of suitably qualified staff, which is not a problem which is unique to Northern Ireland. Mr. Speaker, I should clarify that the funding of the €30 million cost to move to parity in the current year is to be financed by drawing forward proposed allocations for future years. So while I am glad that it is not impacting on the funding, funds available for other services this year, it is important to note that, is, that it has not been financed by an additional allocation to Northern Ireland. Whilst pay is a factor in recruitment and retention, a more significant component, as evidenced by the trade union focus on safe staffing, is the pressure on staff across the HSC. Those will only be properly addressed by transforming the HSC and by fully implementing the actions in the Health and Social Care Workforce Strategy, which was published in 2019. In addition to pay, there is much to do on the refresh of Agenda for Change, and the Department is committed to working with trade unions on this. Of course, pay parity has been one element of the industrial action, but the Assembly will be aware that safe staffing has also been a very significant issue for unions during this dispute. And I want to provide some assurances today. The Workforce Strategy aims by 2026 to meet Northern Ireland's health and social care workforce needs and the needs of the health and social care workforce includes 24 actions under three objections. Achieving the appropriate numbers and skills mix through training, commissioning, good workforce planning, provision of careers advice and the development of new roles. Ensuring that staff feel valued and rewarded and that the HCSC is an employer and trainer of choice and by also improving business intelligence. The strategy which was co-produced with trade unions and others will, if implemented, greatly assist with maintaining safe staffing levels in Northern Ireland. In addition, the Department is developing options to reduce re reliance and spending on agencies and locums. Trade unions have, as part of the current dispute, also made a number of requests in respect of their view of what me measures are needed to address the safe staffing element of the dispute. I respect the fact that trade unions will only end the current dispute if pay parity is achieved and they are convinced that there is a workable plan to achieve safe staffing within a reasonable time frame. I therefore commit today that my officials will work urgently with all unions to produce a costed implementation plan for safe staffing within an agreed short period. Trade unions ask on safe staffing, asks on safe staffing will not be delivered immediately. This will be a long-term endeavour, but I hope that unions and staff will take assurance that the plan will be re realistic, that additional funding will be required, and that I will bring it to the executive for endorsement on that basis. <coughs> to sum up, Mr. Speaker, I believe the component parts are now in place to settle the industrial dispute. I presented a paper to executive colleagues this morning, and I am grateful to my fellow ministers for endorsing those proposals. Additional funding has now been secured. Pay parity with England can be restored. Our nurses and other great health and social care workers can come off the picket line, can get back to the job that they love and that they do so well. As this House would expect, 
I haven't wasted any time following today's executive meeting. I have immediately met with the trade union officials and briefed them on these latest developments. The new offer was outlined by me to trade union representatives this morning and will be formally submitted to them this afternoon. Officials will meet with trade unions tomorrow to agree on the detail. I am grateful to trade union leaders for the constructive meeting this morning. I appreciate that they have to go through their internal processes and I sincerely hope and believe trade unions will now bring industrial action to a swift end. To be clear, this new offer will reinstate pay parity with England and not just for this year. My department is providing a written commitment that will be maintained in 2020-21. 20, Decisive action has also been taken on the vital issue of staffing, and my department is providing a written commitment to immediate high-level engagement with unions to produce a cost implementation plan on safe staffing within an agreed short period. The breakthrough that we all wanted has been achieved. This is a good day after some very difficult days. I am grateful to my colleagues around the executive table for helping to make it happen. We have moved significantly and quickly to take action together. That is a sign of optimism for the future. I know there is scepticism in many quarters about what this health minister and this executive can do for the health and social care service. That is entirely understandable. Many good people doubt whether we can set party politics aside and work constructively together. We shall see. But maybe, just maybe, today will give the sceptics some pause for thought. We have, of course, so much more to do. This has been a very challenging period for health and social care services, but the situation was challenging before the industrial action and it will continue to be for the foreseeable future. Sustained additional funding is essential, but there are no quick fixes. We can, however, provide hope and assurance to our workforce that the problems that they have been telling us about for so long will be addressed once and for all. This Assembly, the Executive, the Department and Trusts are not just hearing these concerns, but listening and acting. If devolution is to work, it has to deliver for our health service. So let's get on with it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, thank you, Minister. And I first call Colm Gilderney, Chairperson of the Health Committee. River, Minister, on your appointment to this very, very important department. Um, I look forward to working with you and with the committee and, and other members of the committee in terms of delivering the needs of our people here in, in, in terms of health. We all recognise that there are many challenges and huge complexity within that department. Um, the challenges include uh, challenges around physical and mental health, but they also go um, across the entire primary, uh, acute and social care sectors. So, that will entail that will it require genuine partnership across parties, across departments, with health trusts, but also with staff, with service users and with their carers. And I think that approach would uh, help to transform and deliver the health care that we need. So can I ask the Minister, recognising the vital role the staff played and what you have acknowledged, to commit to work closely with trade unions in the time ahead through the uh, through the Strategic Health Partnership Forum and also to reconvene the Transformation Advisory Board. Okay, um, I, I, thank the member, I thank the member for his question and welcome him to his new post as, as Chair of the Health Committee and look forward to working with him and the rest of his committee members, Gary, I think, as well as Gary Milton as your Vice Chair. And I think it will be important going forward that we get a good working relationship. And that's why I'll get my office to extend an invite to both you and chair, as chair and vice chair to sit down and meet with me and my senior official team as soon as possible so that we can ensure that is going on. Um, the members slightly took a lead um, when I met the trade unions this morning. I told them that I was reinstating the Strategic Health Partnership Forum, of which they will be a vital component, which gives the, leader, the main leadership team within the trusts and the main trade union officials direct access 
to my ministerial office and, and the table where I can make decisions. So I, I've already moved on that and I look forward to I'll, I'll keep the member abreast. If he wants to be part of that, I'd be more than ex happy to extend a welcome as to him as chair of the Health Committee to sit as part of that as strategic forum. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gary Middleton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I congratulate the Minister on his appointment and indeed the Chair of the Committee as well on his appointment and look forward to working with you both in the time ahead. Can I welcome the Minister's statement uh, and also join with him in paying tribute to the many workers in our health and uh, social care system uh, for, for all of the work that they do, but also the challenging time over this past three years particularly uh, that they have had to face. Uh, to that end, the Minister mentioned in his statement that the pay parity issue on its own uh, will not address uh, the recruitment and retention. Uh, so to that uh, end, will the Minister work with his executive colleagues to ensure that the Graduate Entry Medical School uh, in Londonderry is delivered? and that we work to ensure that we address some of the unique challenges that are faced within our trusts. And again, I, I thank the member for his question and welcome to him to his role as Vice, Vice Chair of the Health Committee and look forward again. And I, and I apologise to both the Chair and the Vice Chair for not giving them advance sight of this statement or engagement, but this morning was, was very quick and moving. In regards to the executive proposals for the, for the Health, health School in McGee. It's something that the department is working with and it's something that is an executive priority that we are looking at. But as the member is fully aware, with the outworkings of the financial commitments that were given last night, we will address where that sits. But I think there is a f f financial commitment and there's also an intention of goodwill around the executive table to make sure that the medical school in McGee proceeds. Call Mark Durgan. I'd also like to congratulate the Minister to wish him well and to say that we do uh, look forward to meeting him, address the many challenges that he will face. And I think it's fair to say though, that the issues of pay parity and safe staffing are possibly the hottest of the hot potatoes that he has inherited. But it's fair to say that we will all be judged on how these issues are handled and how we ensure fairness for our hard-working and heroic health workers. The Minister's ability to uh, ensure pay parity going forward and safe, safe staffing will be predicated on money and where more money uh, can be found from. Although I do seem to recall the Secretary of State saying that there would be money to address this issue, and if that is the case, I wonder why we are going into next year's budget to get money to address it. The statement refers to work being done by the Department uh, to reduce the reliance on agencies and to spend on locums. This reliance has been created by disastrous decision-making in the past, and I wonder if the Minister is in a position to outline what the current spend on agency staff is, and at this early stage, indicate how it might be reduced, if not eradicated completely. Okay, again, I thank the, I thank the member for, for, for his question. Um, workforce planning is key to the success of our, our National Health Service, and I, I don't think that cannot be stressed enough through the engagements with the, our unions and the recognition of the hard working staff that we have relied on so heavily over the past three years why we haven't been in this place. In regards to, to, to spending on agency, agency staff, um, ag the expenditure on agency staff has actually tripled in the last five years, and within the nursing and midwifery group alone it has quadrupled to 52.1 million. 45% um, of the agency expenditure in 1819 was on nursing and midwifery, a 62% increase from the previous year, and other high agency expenditure groups are actually admin and clerical, which comes in at 20.1 million. Um, but I suppose the member's question goes on. I suppose the predication is: should the department not just put a stop to agency workers, or should we look at how that's addressed? We have to be realistic that patient safety is paramount, and any blanket ban on the use of agencies would mean staff shortages and ward closures. So we need to be realistic that there will always be a need for some agency workers to supplement the full-time staff, and the RCN itself has acknowledged that staff employed within the HSC are choosing to register with agencies, some to work additional hours, or others to work full-time within the HSC via agency contracts. So it's about making sure we get that balance right, but my personal preference would be to see more full-time employees within our health service providing the excellent service and delivery that they already do. 
Before I call another speaker, I'd just like to advise the House that there are more than 20 speakers have indicated they wish to ask a question. So I could remind you that you're here to ask a question. Thank you very, very much. Just in respect of all of the other members who do wish to get in as well. Thank you. Uh, Alan Chambers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm delighted uh, to be able to congratulate my uh, colleague Robin Swan on his appointment uh, to Minister of Health. I know that he will uh, conduct his duties with efficiency, uh, but more importantly, with compassion. Can the Minister explain when those staff who reluctantly and with very heavy hearts took the decision to stand on picket lines to highlight their pay parity injustice, expect to see this money that he has secured for them this morning being placed into their accounts? Thank you. I thank the member for his kind words and I can assure the House they weren't scripted by me or any of my, my departmental staff. Uh, in regards of the expected money is when it, when it can be agreed, as I said, we met with trade unions officials this morning and when we have the £30 million assured now that it allows us to go to pay party, there's a lot of detail that now has to be outworked as to how that actually is, is implemented at what levels across various pay scales. So my departmental officials who I want to give a thanks to for the work that they have been doing in the absence of a minister, will meet with the trade unions tomorrow where we can get that finalisation as soon as possible with the hope that we can get that monies into members' pay packets as soon as possible, which will likely be at this stage potentially April at the latest that we would hope to see. But that engagement with the trade union officials started today will continue tomorrow and I give them the commitment if need be we will meet again with them on Thursday afternoon to, to finalise that so we can actually stave off the industrial action that is already scheduled for next week. Okay, thank you. Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I, I forgot to congratulate you on your appointment when I made my first remarks. So, um, And also thank you um, to the Health Minister today and I wish him well. I, I look forward to working on the Health Committee and with the other health spokespersons to support you in your role. Um, in your um, statement, Minister, you talked about four um, trade unions. Um, you didn't mention the Royal College of Midwifery, although you did mention them um, briefly there in, in some of your responses. You will know on the 6th of January this year that they announced that they were going to ballot their members um, because they're £2,000 less in their pay packet than England. Um, and I'm just wondering how you're going to engage with them. The, the vacancies are maybe not as numerous in midwifery, but they're just as acutely felt. And there's not as many um, midwives here on the agencies and, 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 and local banks. So I'm just wondering how you're going to, to take that, that forward. Um, and, and just to take that, could you please... Um, commit to giving them information around the, the new training places that are going to be and a commitment to looking at the maternity strategy that's now out of date. Okay, sir, and, and I thank the member for her question and, and I welcome her to the health committee as well. I know her voice has been critical in, in, in mental health in the last few months while this place hasn't been set. In regards to the four unions I met, those were the four, or mentioned, sorry, those were the four unions that actually had balloted and taken industrial action and the midwives weren't one of those, but they are in the process of balloting members. And the difficulty we have, they were in the meeting this morning, and the difficulty that we may have is that their balloting system has already started, so it may be hard actually for them not to proceed with the ballot for industrial action. So that's why I hope today's announcement is enough to stave off any industrial action from our midwives. In regards to, to the reassurances about how I engage with the Midwife uh, Union. They are actually a member of the Strategic Health Partnership Forum, which I said would re 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 reinstate and get up and running this morning. They were present with me this morning in the meeting, so that they're, they're fully briefed and hopefully up to date. And I am hopeful if she has any contacts in there, if she can use anything to make sure that they don't go to the length of industrial action, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I also join other members in wishing um, the new Minister for Health every success um, going into the future? I like in a statement when he mentioned the word optimism, because I think any Minister for Health um, needs to have a, a massive degree of optimism. And can I also wish um, the Chair and Vice Chair all the very best as well? Um, I will miss my role within health, but 
Um, I look forward, as, as Chair of the Department of Communities, working along with health because so much of that overlaps. Um, I'm also uh, quite mindful that I was part of Agenda for Change when I worked for the Northern Trust in 2004, and seems like an awfully long time ago. I just wanted to ask the Minister about conversations that he may have been having around issues to do with banding. Um, I know uh, specifically, now this may well have been rectified by now, but specifically the ambulance service had raised concerns around the banding under um, Agenda for Change, and they're still waiting, or they were still waiting um, to hear back uh, information on that. You may have that detail, you may not, um, but um, if, if you can let me know how that has proceeded. Um, I, I don't have that specific answer for you today, but I'll make sure member, or, or my officials get in contact and we write to, to the member, because I do value the work that she did when she was chair of the Health Committee. She was, she was a great advocate and voice for that. Uh, I welcome her to her role in communities, because I, I, as, I, as the member has said, there is a great la overlap, and I think it's something that I was stressing around the executive table. The Department of Health has an input into every department, every home, every house within Northern Ireland. So it's vital that we get that cross-party, cross-executive support. Uh, when the member said, you know, about having optimism as taken on Health Minister, there's been other words has been used to describe me taking on this role, and optimism was, was one of the more positive, I can assure you, but I will make sure that I, I write to the, to the member in regards to the pay banning in regards to the ambulance service. Okay, thank you. Pat Sheehan. Congratulations to the Minister and his appointment as, as Health Minister. Uh, and I wish him every success in the time ahead. Uh, the Minister will be aware that the uh, Nursing and Mid Midwifery Task Force that was established by Michelle O'Neill when she was Minister has recently concluded its report in the workforce. And I'm wondering, would the Minister give a commitment to publish uh, that report as a matter of urgency? I thank the member for his, his warm words of welcome and, and in regards, I, I know that wasn't actually mentioned in the statement, but I'm, I'm happy to confirm to the minister it was raised, or the member, sorry, that it was raised this morning by the RCN and the Midwife Council. I haven't had sight of that task force report at this minute in time, but I have given a commitment this morning that we will publish it as soon as I have had time to review it. And I've also given a commitment to the unions this morning that I will engage with them before I publish it, so that we're all on the same page going forward in regards to where we are with our health service. So rather than just rush to publish it immediately, I'm in the conversation with the trade unions and department officials to make sure that the task force report is fit for purpose and that it actually does the job that we want it to do. I call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I welcome the Minister to his place today and want to place on record my firm commitment to work closely with him and his officials in the days that lie ahead. I wholeheartedly welcome his statement today, and in particular the speed in which it has been delivered before the House. As a member of this House for Upper Ban, I know, and the Minister will know, that Craigavon Area Hospital plays such a vital role within our health service. And I know that the Minister's clarity today on a proposed way forward in relation to pay parity will mean so much to our hard-working nursing professionals as they continue to carry out the life-saving work within our health service. I pay tribute to them for their resilience and their service in what has been a very difficult time. Minister, you have mentioned that uh, the crisis, much attention has been around pay parity, but a grave concern for many within the uh, medical professionals, profession is that issue in relation to safe staffing levels. On a re recent visit to Craigavon Area Hospital, Mr. Speaker, uh, I discussed winter pressures. Could the Minister please outline to me today what he intends to take forward in relation to recruitment and retainment within our health service to make it a safe place for patients. Thank you. Okay, um, I, th I thank the member for his question. And I'm sure when he was talking about those winter pressures, if it was the time you were delivering the presents to the children in the children's ward, can I just commend the member for actually taking that action for a, ch a child in a ward over that festive period? needs all the positivity they can get. And I just want to congratulate the member for, for actually taking that initiative. In regards to, to recruitment and retention, it's a key piece of work in our, in our workforce planning. And we do have to make sure that we value the nurses 
and the health service workers that we have in place. And I hope today, by moving to pay parity to the English level and our reassurances and commitments in regard to safe, stand safe standards, safe working standards, that we actually start to move to that reassurance that they will stay in their posts longer and they see the health service in Northern Ireland as a good place to work. And as Minister, that's where I want to take us to. In regards to recruitment, we will be looking and working with the trade unions in regards to the number of nurse placements we can actually take on, because we have to be realistic that a trainee nurse has to have experience, live experience on a ward. So while numbers, high numbers may look good on paper, we have to make sure that they're provided with the training that they actually need to deliver the service that they want to deliver and we want them to deliver. Thank you, Nicole. Carly Cullen. Thank you very much. Congratulations to yourself. Um, and appreciate the statement that you brought forward in such a timely fashion. You will also may have correspondence on your desk for me regarding drugs for CF sufferers as well as suicide prevention initiatives in North Belfast. So I look forward to your response and even meeting you on those. Um, the Minister has mentioned, and indeed other members have mentioned, the whole issue around um, rec recruitment and retention and indeed workforce planning, particularly around safe staffing. Can the Minister, to his, the best visibility today, even through this renewed Strategic Health Partnership Forum, try and look at workforce planning seriously? Because I too remember Agenda for Change from 2004. Because our concern is that effectively we're putting public money into private health care at the detriment of health and social care workers and effectively privatising a service that needs to be free at the point of delivery. So I wish the, mem the Minister well. But I do look forward to, in the coming months and indeed time ahead, to more substantial plans, if we get this resolved this year, to tackle the big, big issues around workforce planning. And again, I, I, thank, the, I thank the member for her question on her two letters. And I can assure you, if you've sent me two letters, it's in the pile somewhere that I've received over the past. Uh, we'll see, Carl. We'll see. I make no promises or no commitments here today. I remember how you treated me as minister. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That wasn't too bad, though. To be fair, it wasn't too bad. <laughs> uh, in regards, in regards to workforce planning, let's not underestimate the scale of the problem that it has been, and let's not underestimate how much more difficult it became in the past three years without that strategic leadership that a minister and the elected officials could give. Could, could give. So my, my engagement today with departmental officials, with union officials and the creation of the Strategic Health Partnership Forum, I hope does bring about good things and I hope brings about a truly inclusive, positive engagement process at the head of the Department of Health round, round, round my ministerial table, because I think that's how it works, it's when we're all playing an integral part playing the same part to make sure we're actually delivering for the staff who work for us and for the patients who need us. Okay, thank you. Call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I also congratulate uh, the Minister on his appointment and uh, reiterate our party leader's commitment to working and not uh, play party politics with the portfolio that you carry and the heavy workload that you have. Minister, in relation to the workforce strategy and in particular around the recruitment of perhaps mature students, I wonder would you commit to looking at best practice elsewhere? I, I understand in the south of Ireland the colleges of further education are used extensively, uh, particularly around uh, the training of mature students and also, Minister, in relation, I mean, whilst there's terrific news for nurses, uh, I believe that this statement will also include our social care staff because one cannot work without the other. Uh, and, uh, no, I, I thank the member. Certainly, if there is best practice out there, I think that's how we learn. There's no point in us within the Department of Health in Northern Ireland trying to recreate a wheel or a, a, a functioning body that already looks, works elsewhere, so I'll, I'll, I'll commit to doing that, I'm happy to commit to doing that and getting my officials set up along those lines. In regards to the utilisation of mature students and how we introduce them into, into our workforce, hopefully, and I don't want to preempt what I was asked previously, but the utilisation of McGee and bringing forward actually advanced students and mature students up there, I think will have an active role if we can get the co collegiate funding 
to get that off the ground. But we also need to be, 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 be strategic as well. And I'm sure the member remembers in my role of employment and learning how I openly promoted the Open University. Now, they have an active training course for nurses in there and, and social workers as well. So, so I might as well get the plug in now that, that, that that's there. So as about how we can look at every avenue for training, for enhanced training, for bringing mature students and mature employees into the National Health Service because that's what makes it work if we have that balance and wide range of individuals actually to deliver in our health service here in Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you. Uh, Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to just take this opportunity to uh, wish you all the best in your job as Minister for Health. And indeed, it is possibly one of the most important uh, roles that any of us could perform in elected politics and I look forward to this next few years as you deliver the, the transformation that is so badly needed and I'm sure the House would join me in thanking the staff who have endured for a number of years and took that really a hard decision when they were balloted for action and if you've been employed in, in, in any facet of a blue light service when you're trying to protect and save life it is the most difficult thing you will ever do to take industrial action and full credit must go to them. So. Uh, thank you for your statement, um, uh, Minister. And I just want to ask you, could you give a, a ministerial commitment uh, to address through the workforce strategy in a risk-appropriate manner to tackle the areas of greatest need with regard to workforce planning? And in particular, I'm thinking in the areas of mental health and learning disability. And look at the strategies um, that have embarked in uh, England uh, in terms of how they go about uh, attracting staff into those very difficult fields and indeed retaining those staff. Okay, and again, you know, I, I thank the member for, for his question, and I think it is important that we all acknowledge that within the National Health Service is the role that's still in the commitment and the support that is there in regards to our mental health and the mental health support teams and activists and, and charities and commissioners that we have out there. Because mental health is an area of importance to the health and social care system. And part of a steam between mental health and physical health will actually be key to this. So the Department of Health has been considering actions that can improve mental health provisions to those who need it. So I'm keen to improve mental health services. And at this point in time, I'm actually considering a draft mental health action plan that can take some of those actions forward and actually put mental health where it should be in the centre of our National Health Service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, thank you. A call on uh, Orlea Flynn. Uh, um, congratulations again to Mr Swan on your um, appointment as Minister for Health. Um, I welcome the measures that you have outlined here today uh, to resolve the pay party issue um, and hopefully to bring the industrial action um, to an end. But today I would also like to highlight some of the serious and genuine ongoing concerns around how we as a society, not necessarily um, specific to the Department of Health, but how we as a society deal with a complex issue of mental ill health and indeed suicide prevention. Um, can the Minister give reassurances that he will fully fund the recently published Protect Life 2 suicide prevention strategy? And I should also just say that I look forward to engaging with the Minister um, on these critical issues in the time ahead. Thank you. Okay, I, I, th I thank the member for her question and I welcome her to the House. Um, Protect Life 2 was not specifically mentioned in the statement it is, but the suicide prevention strategy is critical to the central work that we in the Department of Health will do. So, in regards to Protect Life 2, I'll, I'll give the member a commitment for the full implementation of the Protect Life 2 strategy and a realisation of the funding that I actually require from all our executive colleagues because at this moment in time it has been costed between three to four million for recurring funding. It would be, in my opinion, money well spent because it would alleviate pressures from elsewhere in the health service and the Department of Communities and all their areas. But at this point in time, I will need executive buy-in from other colleagues to make sure that we have the support to bring that forward within our department. And I do welcome and I acknowledge at this point in time the support that I have received from other ministerial colleagues and other parties in, in the role that taking on this health issue and the, the Department of Health will require that collegiate approach. And so far, I have been appreciative of that. That's three days in, so we're doing not too bad. We're off to a good start, Robin. Uh, Chris Little. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That our health and social care staff regarded strike action as necessary should be a source of serious reflection, if not shame, for this Assembly. And our only response now can be to prioritise the health and well-being of our health and social care staff. So can I ask the Health Minister, therefore, can he assure our nurses and health and care staff that he will introduce safe staffing legislation to this Assembly, recruit additional nurses, and seek to improve nursing bursary provision in order to protect the health and well-being of our health and social care staff in Northern Ireland? Um, there's a lot in the members ask there, and I, th I think as far as question, um, when I took over this portfolio, I prioritised pay parity because I thought that was the most critical issue that we had to resolve as an assembly to give us some semblance of credibility. And again, I'm supportive of the other parties who did that. And, and the list of actions that the member asked me to take, I apologise, I don't remember them all off the top of my head, but I will give him a, a firm reassurance that within my first day brief, which I received on Saturday afternoon, and I'm still reading, the, the issues and the challenges that lie solely within this department are massive. And the only way we can get the Department of Health to work and work effectively is by the support of every member and every minister in this House to truly value those individuals that we've left at the front line on their own for the last three years. I call Raymond McCartney. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and can obviously congratulate the Minister, in which obviously is a very challenging uh, uh, portfolio. Uh, I, I, I welcome the statement today. I welcome the, the speed in which you have met with the unions and, and hopefully share your optimism that you have put on the table an offer which will see an end to uh, the industrial, industrial action. I mean, a big part of your statement was the sort of historical context of, of, of the dispute, but I think as we go forward, and particularly in uh, your, your own sort of portfolio and the, the fact that you have got the pledge from all the parties to be supportive of you, but I think critical to this is ensuring that we have some sort of mechanism that decisions that are made in the here and now, we also look at the long-term implications, because I think this is a classic case of sometimes. A decision made that people think is the right thing to do at one time, but it only pushes an hour challenge down the road. So a commitment from the Minister to, to ensure that we have a mechanism in place to safeguard us against that. And I thank I thank the member for for his question. I, I did think it was important to set out the historical reasons why we got to where we were, because I would agree with, with Chris Little when he said it should never have happened. We should never have been in a place where we left our nurses so exposed that after 104, 104 years they felt industrial action was necessary. And I am optimistic because I had a good engagement with the unions this morning, but I do want to make members aware it is now over to them and their boards to make that decision. I have went as far as I can go, and I think the executive stretched itself as to where they allowed me to go with the trade unions this morning, and I hope that that has reciprocated the words I used to the trade unions and with them this morning was, on the 18th of December, I stood with them. I asked them this morning to stand with me so we can foresee and prevent that industrial action. In regards to how we bring about that collegiate approach to make sure we offset this in the future, I hope that that strategic health partnership forum that we re-established this morning to get up and run again does do some of that foresight forward-looking programme because with fantastic officials in the Department of Health, the chief nurse, all the rest of them with the practical experience, but it's good to bring our unions in and those at the ground to have that experience as well, sitting around the table, because sometimes a nursing award can see something that somebody and a minister in an office can never see or realise. Thank you. And I call Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and congratulations on your appointment. I also want to welcome the Minister and congratulate you and assure you of my support um, as you take on probably one of the most challenging portfolios, it has to be acknowledged. I welcome the statement from the Minister today, and as a South Down MLA who stood outside Daisy Hill with those uh, health care workers on very wet and damp occasions, it was notable how they expressed where they professionally felt very vulnerable, turning up to shifts where there simply were not enough people on duty, and then to arrive home only to find that they're consistently underpaid. And I appreciate that that problem has compounded through no fault of your own, 
um, with not least the three years of inaction from this House, which we should all be shameful of. Um, I would also say that you know, those extremely undervalued healthcare workers have today hopefully got the message from this House that you are valued. You stood out there to represent everybody in society, including us, because for, unfortunately the health service is something that each of us at some stage in our, our life will, will need to lean on. I am a little concerned, Minister, um, when I look through the and I appreciate it was a very swift gathering of resources and a creative way of bringing easement to this problem. But it is that you speak of easements, which I would be curious to know more about. I wouldn't expect that detail perhaps of you today, but at a later time it would be. And I would be keen to know how we get this off on a more sustainable footing um, through efficiencies within the health service. And I would ask the minister in his approach to efficiencies, if he would look at every opportunity available to find those efficiencies. And some may lie in an all island health approach. And I'd urge him to look in that direction. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I thank the member for a question. In regards to the budgeting process we're going through, I'm actually due to meet Minister of Finance tomorrow before we go back to the Secretary of State and, uh, and the Prime Minister in regards to where this financial, financial package actually finishes up. In regards to cross-border working, we have prime examples where that does work in regards to children's heart surgery which has already been developed and is already working very well. In regards to an all-island health service, I would prefer to stick with the UK's National Health Service because it's free of point of use and free of point of delivery. And I think that is actually the health service that we in Northern Ireland respect and value, despite class, creed, political persuasion or anything. So our National Health Service here in Northern Ireland is something that we should cherish and value. Here. And I would encourage her because I know she does the same. Okay, thank you, and I could call that Roy Beggs. <clears throat> I too think I uh, wish to congratulate the Minister on his appointment uh, to a very challenging post. Um, and for a swift engagement with uh, his executive colleagues, with his uh, um, departmental staff, and with the trade unions, and hope that we can bring this dispute to an end and have fair pay for our uh, valued healthcare staff and in the future ensure that there will be safe working conditions from them all. But in the Minister's statement he's indicated that there are some 7,000 uh, current vacancies within the health and social care structure. Quite a, an enormous number and that transformation uh, is one of the reasons uh, for those vacancies. Can he assure us that in moving forward that there will be more advanced planning so that uh, the staff will be trained uh, well, in a, well in a timely basis so that when change occurs we're not left with vacancies and forced to employ very uh, expensive locum staff uh, and that services can be uh, speedily improved and implemented. And again, I, I thank the, the member for, for his question and again, I, I don't want to sound like a, like a broken record to the member but uh, and that sort of forward-looking, when change is coming, uh, approach that I think the health department and health service will need to take. I'm hopeful that that strategic health partnership forum will be able to identify where those gaps between where we intend going and what we're able to do can actually be identified by those who are working at the front line and on the, on the wards and international health service at the ground level. So, the, the gaps between what we expect and what we can actually get people doing aren't significant enough that we have to bring in additional staff to actually plug those gaps. So I, I'm putting a lot of reliance on the Strategic Health Partnership Forum, which hasn't met in a very long time, but I think it is the right body for engagement that we take a look forward a lot of these challenges and do that forward planning and, and looking into where our difficulties and where our opportunities actually lie. Uh, Patsy McGlone. Gurm Agat Kyan Korlia, I guess, Mako Gardjuka Slashinera. I congratulate the Minister on his appointment um, and I look forward to uh, dealing with a few issues locally and more recently with him. Um, of course, among those issues are workforce issues. Uh, many of those have been already dealt with in some detail here, but particularly workforce issues relating to uh, district nursing, health visitors, 
um, if the Minister could look at that. And then uh, we've heard so much uh, today about the difficulties where staff have been forced to take industrial action. So could I ask that the Minister, as a gesture of goodwill, uh, instruct uh, health chiefs not to dock the pay of those staff, many of whom are in difficult financial circumstances as they are. It will be a substantial and significant goodwill gesture on behalf of the Department. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I thank the member for his question. and I can assure you that is not the first time I have been asked that question today. It is not a commitment I can give because it is something that has not been costed or looked at. But as, a, as an expression of goodwill, pay parity goes a significant step to reassure our staff in the National Health Service that we value them. So to put that, put that additional conditionality that they don't lose the pay, it's not something that I can commit to here today, and I don't know if it's something I can actually legally do at this matter in time. But I'll explore it, but I'll give no commitment. I call uh, Mr John Dallet. Uh, Mr Speaker, may I add my best wishes and support? And as someone who in recent times is receiving extraordinary medical attention in Alton and Galvin Hospital uh, from outstanding doctors and nurses, will the Minister take whatever steps are necessary to ensure that never again will staff feel so demoralised that they feel the need to join the picket lines and instead they are allowed to concentrate on their vocations, uh, which of course is in the interest not just of the National Health Service, but all of us who have had the experience uh, to benefit from it. Um, can I thank the member for his question? And can I just say how good it is actually to see you here today? You're looking here, well. Here, here, here. And I appreciate the fact you are here because I know when there's a tough question to be asked in the health department that you're, you're able to do it. But what you asked here today, I think, is a commitment and a duty that everyone in this House should give, not just me as Health Minister. We should never have allowed our health service and our nurses to be pushed to the point where industrial action was the only thing they seen as an option as to how they could get, actually get the message across. They did not want to do it. I know by talking to many of them, it was their last, last resort. And I hopefully I'm hopeful that today's meeting, today's commitments, that we can see them de-escalate that industrial action next week and the other unions that are going or intending to ballot their members in industrial action actually find some way of sidestepping that. Because I hope the trade unions, through the engagement with me this morning, know that with me they have somebody they can talk to and somebody that will listen to them. And again, I'm glad to see the member in this place. Okay, thank you. Uh, Claire Bailey. Thank you, Speaker. Um, and also welcome the Minister into office and commend you for um, producing this um, in your very short three days in office so far. So very well done. Um, I'd maybe like to go back to those uh, in year um, the, the, the funding numbers that you are given in terms of the in-year easements, and I noted that you could not give any particular um, detail on where they might be coming from and that you would be speaking to the Finance Minister. Uh, maybe ask if the Minister could let us know whether that will be coming um, strictly from the health budgets or will you be looking cr cross-departmental support with this? But also really keen to know if the Minister believes, could this settlement being produced and put forward today, um, could it have been achieved before now in the absence of a local minister in post? And I, and I thank the, the member for her questions. In, in regards to, to the easements of you know, the £79 million that was ass assembled, I think was the, the, the phrase that was used, to go toward the 2019-2020 pay party, my understanding is it is all internal departmental health monies, but I will check that and come back to the member and verify that. Do I think this could have been delivered without a minister? No. But I think it was very clear, and that's why we as a party at that point in time, and I don't want to get party political in regards to where we're going, but that's why we thought a minister, even a direct rule minister, was needed to introduce this. Because not only did we put our health workers in an insidious position, we put our departmental officials 
and an insidious position of position, they shouldn't be. They're there to deliver the directions of elected officials, not take them themselves. So let's go to the step now that there's a minister in place, the assembly's in place, and that we take our responsibilities rather than leaving it to others. Okay, uh, thank you, and I'll call Jim Allister. Thank you. Um, could I join with the minister in paying tribute to our remarkable health workers across the service? I think that was a tribute which was well made. In that context, and though it wasn't the minister's responsibility, the present dispute arose because a Northern Ireland executive foolishly broke pay parity in Northern Ireland. Would the minister therefore today take the opportunity on behalf of the Northern Ireland executive to apologise to the health workers for the breaking of pay parity and taking us into this crisis which didn't need otherwise to have that dimension? And secondly, I'm dismayed to hear that though he is finding money to sort the pay parity issue, he's having to borrow it from next year. How does he square that along with the assertion that there is no financial money to carry it forward? How does he square that with the boast of the Secretary of State that there was money to deliver a, a resolution? And is it confirmation that parties signed up to a deal without the certainty of the funding? And how stupid was that? Okay, and I think the member for us points on his questions. In regards to an apology for a previous executive, I'm not in the position to make that. But personally, I apologise to our health service workers that they were left in a position that they felt strike action was the only necessary option that they had to take. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to make sure that we don't get to a position where that actually happens again. And I value the member's critique of the executive as there because I do value it and I do welcome it because he's able to point out what others may not be able to be seen or what others want to admit to see. Because when we met the Secretary of State last night, it was very clear from all parties that what had been proposed or what had been offered was not on the table. Now, whether that was of the Secretary of State's doing or Treasury's doing, I'm not in a position at this minute in time, but I can assure the member that from the point that we found that out yesterday evening, there was serious engagement between the Department of Finance, Treasury, Secretary of State, Department of Health, to ensure that we were in a position today to find that 30 million that is needed in year, this year, to provide pay party. Yeah. Here, here. Okay, thank you, and I call Jerry Carl. Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his statement. Um, can the Minister confirm that since no new funding streams were provided as part of the New Deal, as confirmed by this announcement, that funding streams which have been discovered to resolve industrial action were already within the capacity of the Health Ministry, proven uh, what parties like People Before Profit and the health workers themselves say from the start that the money was always there for pay party and that the new executive was indeed duped by the British and Irish governments when it came to the promises of funding? Oh, I, I, would, I would actually have to dis disagree with the member. The money was not there. We did not have, we didn't have the £30 million that we needed to finish off pay party for 2019-2020. So it is through bringing monies forward over the next two years for the monies that have been obtained to ensure that we have pay party guaranteed for next year as well, because I want to give our staff the reassurance that the monies are there for today and for the future. And I give the, the member a commitment, as far as my knowledge is, that money is not, was not there to be signed off immediately that could have solved this issue without a minister being in place. Okay, thank you. And I call Claire Sogden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I wish to congratulate the Minister, um, both personally and professionally. I sincerely wish you well. Um, you have taken on the most difficult brief, and I think the Ulster Unionist Party have to be commended for doing so, as the two parties before them seem to, to avoid that brief like the plague. 
Um, thank you for your statement. Um, I do appreciate the rapid response in which you have taken the decisions you have taken. I think um, it is very clear that every member of this House uh, share, or shares the, the actions that you're going to put forward to try and uh, resolve this uh, pay dispute and indeed the, the, the safer staffing. Um, I also appreciate the written commitment for uh, 2021. I think that's really important um, th that the, the workers get that because we are uh, very quickly coming to an end of this particular financial year. I suppose the figure that does very much jump out at me is the 67 uh, million that hasn't yet been found, and I expect um, it will be uh, at minimum another 67 million for the year 21-22 that you indeed would have responsibility for. So altogether, we're looking for 134 million that hasn't been found anywhere. And indeed, I hope the the, the gentleman down the hill at Stormont House hears those figures because I think it's it's important that he does. You know, added on to all the other pressures um, in in relation to resolving waiting lists, which indeed was another commitment that was in the new decade, new approach uh, deal. Um, and is the Minister confident that we will be able to secure those monies? And I do appreciate all the commitments that he has put forward to date, but how realistic is it that we are going to be able to deliver the promises both in the new deal, but also um, the written commitment that he's put before this House today? Um, I, I'll start with the, the latter point. It's a written commitment. I've put before the House today, so I'll hold myself responsible and the members should, should know that. In regard to the rapid engagement with the unions, I, I want to commend them for their, their reaction and their speed for taking on the proposal that we put forward to them this morning, because it is important that we try to forestall any more industrial action, because that only adds to the additional, the additional difficulty that, that is we do find. In regards to living wage increases, they'll have to be found and they have to be delivered, and like you, I do hope other people are listening and other people realise that when our government in Westminster makes the announcement on an increase in living wage, the knock-on effect that it has to other departments, other industries and other sectors um, across, across this United Kingdom. She did use one word which I hope I'll never hear again, and that's plague. Because when my first day brief, I found if there is an outbreak, I'm probably responsible for it as well. But that's, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, no, but I do. I, I, I sincerely thank the member for her support and the critique that she'll provide as well, because I do value it and I do value engagement as well. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And that concludes uh, questions on the statement. Returning to the question of the election, uh, to the position of Principal Deputy Speaker, um, I'm pleased to inform you all that the technical hitch with the electronic voting record, recording system has been resolved. All members have now had an opportunity to pass through the lobbies and register their vote. The clerk, could please read the result. 80 members voted, of which 49 voted aye, 61.3 per cent. 36 nationalists voted, of which 25 voted aye, 69.4 per cent. 35 unionists voted, of which 24 voted aye, 68.6 per cent. Nine others voted, of which None voted aye, zero percent. The motion is carried with cross community support. Okay, so I offer uh, my congratulations to the Principal Deputy Speaker Christopher Stalford as the motion has been agreed. That concludes the, this particular item. I want to move on to the just to remind the party whips that the business committee is due to meet in ten minutes immediately after this session is adjourned. The uh, item four on the order of the German. The business committee has agreed that in order to allow time for parties to allocate committee membership, the next sitting should take place on Monday, the 20th of January 2020. An order paper will issue today after the business committee has met. The question is that the assembly do now adjourn. The assembly is adjourned. Carmela Magov, Flan. <laughs>